It's three minutes after ten. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we will dive straight into what is clearly one of the biggest issues of the moment and, and kind of always is. I don't know. Can I confide in you? Is it too early in the week for me to confide in you? I... <laughs> I feel as if there's a, a, a destination to which we should all be heading this morning, but I can't quite work out what the best route to it is. I want to talk about the NHS. Uh, I, I am, I'm afraid, always going to remind you that when David Cameron became Prime Minister in 2010, patient satisfaction with the NHS was the highest on record. Now, the records don't go back to Queen Victoria's time, nor, of course, does the NHS, but you take my point. So uh, there is political relevance to that observation, but not political point scoring, because what has been done can usually, but not always, be undone, can't it? Some of the elements of this conversation that we have already had together include the I think the widespread recognition that some of the heavy lifting with regard to reducing waiting lists and and setting the course, if you like, back towards the sort of patient satisfaction levels that we had in 2010. So reducing the waiting lists, improving the service, some of that heavy lifting is going to have to be done by the private sector. And, And here's an example of why I love my job, why I'm so lucky to have you in my life, is that the first time we talked about that, it seemed to me to be somewhat overly optimistic to think that Wes Streeting's promise that the private sector would do a sort of short-term Philip would step into the breach created by the size of waiting lists and help to fix them and then step back again, as in the NHS would not become reliant upon that private sector provision. By the second or third time that we had that conversation... Um, I was a lot more comfortable, a lot more confident. Not necessarily that they'd pull it off, but that if there were problems on the horizon, that was not one of them. Because what, what does it do? If you're, if you're in the healthcare game uh, as a consequence of, of wanting to turn a profit, then you want to turn a profit today and tomorrow. And if that involves investment in uh, equipment, in, in staff, in um, property, that will help you make money for the next two or three years... And then that waiting list is no longer long enough to necessitate your presence in the space, in that space, both physical and philosophical, then you'll move on and you'll do something else. So so you can see a sort, I'm not turning into a sort of Tufton Street vampire, but you can see a nimbleness that the private sector can deliver with a big temporary problem that the NHS perhaps isn't built to work on because the NHS is there to deal with all permanent problems, which will ebb and flow slightly. They'll go up and down. But such is the disaster visited upon us by politicians in thrall to Tufton Street vampires and free market lunatics and all the rest of it. The, 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 the problem that needs to be addressed, the length of the waiting list, and crucially as well, you know what is going to be the recurring theme topically of this programme for, for the, at least the next parliamentary term is this crisis of, of, of long-term sickness. And, and I don't know what you think of when I say long-term sickness. Do you think of long COVID, perhaps? Do you think of um, a, a, a morbid obesity that you can't get help with? Do you think of mental health, depression, anxiety? Because you know it could be a hip. It could be the fact that you can't go to work because you can barely walk. I always remember my mum telling me that she couldn't get upstairs anymore. And she was already past retirement age. But imagine if that had happened 10, 15, 20 years earlier. And she, she's waiting for a hip. And there's no earthly way she could have done the jobs that she used to do on, her, on the makeup, on the Estee Lauder counter in Owen Owen or running her own little dress shop on Station Hill in Kidderminster. There's no way she could have done those jobs if she, ha- if she couldn't. So she would be long term. So we, we've got a really unclear idea of what that means. But it's clearly going to be a top priority for the current government. And just because they're not incompetent, well, they might be incompetent, but just because they're not weird and vicious doesn't mean, of course, that they'll get it right. So I see worries now coming from people that I like and people that I trust and people that I respect, warning that they think West Streeting is perhaps embarked upon a programme of rather more widespread privatisation. And then I wonder whether I should be worried about that. And then I open the Times and read about the rise in the number of patients using their savings to pay for private hip operations. And then I think of that lovely lady whose name I think was Leslie, who messaged us the very first time we scratched at the surface of this subject and told me that she had, against all of her political principles, just paid for her little grandson to have his tonsils taken out 
out in the private sector because the poor fella was having his life thrown into all manner of disarray by the length of the wait there would be for him to get it done on the NHS. So there is so much going on here that I don't know on a Monday morning, on the average Monday morning, I don't know where to start. I don't know what route we should be... I'm doing quite a lot of physical explanation this morning, which conveys my confusion, but I appreciate Unless you're watching on YouTube, you won't be fully appreciating the theatre of the moment. Um, you see what I mean, though? Here's the NHS. Here are a hundred different roads leading to it as a topic of our conversation this morning, and I don't know which road to take. I don't know which road to take. So, you know, I'm in your hands. 0345 6060973 is the number that you need. Some early contributions before we set our course a little bit more clearly on, on the direction in which we're going. West Streeting and, and Keir Starmer currently speaking to and about the NHS. Uh, have a look at what they've had to say shortly. Richard tells me there are 20% more patients at my GP surgery in the last five years. This was stated in a letter to all patients about... Um, a drop in service. Some people, of course, take that as an opportunity to scream about foreigners. Others will point out that the um, number of GPs who are currently unemployed and looking for work is absurdly and almost incomprehensibly high. So the NHS is in a complete mess. Morale is low and, and staff is in some quarters being hemorrhaged. Um, you need to accept the number of patients as a constant and then work on the number of doctors and nurses. Of course you do. Hospital bosses sound alarm as Streeting starts NHS reform plan. Doctors and hospital chiefs have fired warning shots over the government's plans to reform the NHS in England, warning that they could increase waiting times and demoralise staff. That's what I mean. Just because they're not weird and nasty doesn't actually mean that they will get it right. This is relevant, you know. Almost half of workforce get no support from employer. This is relevant. Ministers urge to increase £3 basic tax rate. What do you think the £3 basic tax rate is? That's your statutory sick pay for a full-time worker. Um, uh, the worry now is that hundreds of thousands of people who can't work, possibly because they can't walk until they get a new hip, won't be able to pay their essential bills while they're off work and relying on three quid an hour um, statutory sick pay. White Britons are dying faster than minorities. That's relevant to a conversation about the NHS. Lifestyle choices such as drinking and smoking could, reports the Daily Telegraph, be behind this cultural divide in mortality rates. It's extraordinary when you look at the news some days and see that almost everything is relevant to the health of the nation. The health of the nation. What could be more important? And then you come to the story on the front of The Guardian. So you see what I mean about there being so many routes into this conversation. I, I would, I think, lean towards the number of people, the rise in the number of patients using their savings to pay for private hip hops. But that feels quite close to territory that we've explored together before. And finally, the Daily Mail, excelling even its own dismal standards by reporting that critics have hit out um, over the government's plans for a public consultation about the NHS. So Wes Streeting, the health secretary, wants to listen to patients and staff about the future of the health service over the next 10 years. And, and he's been attacked for that. Whoa, what, what do you want them to do, lads? You want them to go full truss, just announce an absolute barrage of bonkersness, inflict it on an entirely undeserving nation, cheer it to the rafters like you did with Liz Truss, and then wash your hands and pretend it never happened when the full impact of the disaster becomes crystal clear in everything from your mortgage payments to your cost of living. I mean, extraordinary. They're so desperate to land punches on this bunch that they are now condemning him for actually seeking the views of patients and staff about the future of the NHS over the course of the next 10 years. 12 minutes after 10 is the time. Is that the way into it? Is that what we do now? Do we ask patients and staff? about what they think needs to be done to the NHS over the next 10 years. There's one particular area of interest for me, which is the Guardian front page story, and that the fears related to privacy, um, because West Streeting is going to unveil plans for portable medical records. So you're going to have your entire health record on your phone, effectively. It'll be stored digitally in one place. I... I'm not currently conscious of what I'm supposed to be scared about with regard to that. If my bank can do it, why can't the NHS? If my employer can do it, got all my pay slips and what have you, what would I rather 
keep quiet. The contents of my pay slips or the contents of my NHS record. Well, I'd be comfortable publishing either, but some of my colleagues might be a little bit upset to learn about my bunions. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be worried about in the context of um, the passports for all patients despite privacy fears. We shall have a look at that, but, but I think we might. Should we try that? I mean, historically, sometimes when I... You know, it, what I do at 10 o'clock in the morning is I, put, I drop a jumper on the field, right? I drop a jumper in the park, and then I, then I pace 10 paces, 12 paces, some days 20 paces. I'm not talking about how long it takes me to get to the point. I'm talking about the size of the goal that I create for you. So I've just dropped one jumper. I've dropped my jumper. Now, can I borrow your jumper, Keith? Keith, chuck us your jumper. And now I'm going to decide where to drop Keith's jumper, and that will be the goal posts between which I want you to shoot. That's where I want you to call 0345 6060 973 and get the ball between those posts. Now, historically, when the posts are miles apart, you are sometimes a little slow to take up the invitation. So I'm going to do a weird exercise in philosophical flourish now because I'm going to simultaneously create goalposts that are very wide apart, very far apart, but at the same time, in a sort of weird Star Trek kind of way, they're also quite close together. Because your answer to this question will depend entirely on who you are. So, in fact, rather than setting up one massive pair of goalposts, I have a million jumpers. I have 1.4, 2.8 million jumpers. There are 1.4 million goal mouths for you to shoot through. Because you, as a patient or an NHS uh, professional will have a very specific answer to the question of what needs to be done in the next 10 years. So Wes Streeting right now as we speak is both unveiling an NHS 10-year plan and indeed fielding the views of patients and staff over what the health service needs to do, where it needs to be, what it needs to change over the course of the next 10 years. And I think I'm going to ask you that question. What would you do? If West Streeting asked you, what do you want the NHS to do? How do you want the NHS to change? How do you um, foresee or, or what do you desire in the context of the NHS? If West Streeting right now said to you, what do you want as a doctor, as a nurse or as a patient, potential or actual, what would you tell him? 0345 6060 973. We'll get stuck into this data privacy issue. But to start with, call me now. And remember, the, the goals are as far apart or as close together as you please. Right now, I want you to tell me what needs to be done. What does West Streeting need to do to the NHS? 0345 6060 973. Because we can talk about these matters until we're blue in the face, right? And we do. And we will continue to do so. But surely the big challenge facing any government is the fact that every one of us is going to have a slightly different answer to what seems at first glance to be an incredibly simple question. What does West Streeting really need to do? 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. It's 1016. 10.18 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I'm not sure Liam is taking things entirely seriously. He says, peanut butter M&Ms in the hospital vending machines, please. And um, I, I think we will steer towards that data conversation as well. But in the first instance, uh, West Streeting, I, I think we can just mention once more, is coming under attack from the Daily Mail for wanting to know what patients and doctors... How dare he ask patients and, and medical staff what they want for the NHS when he could simply be asking foreign investors and, um, and Dido Harding? What's he doing wasting his time uh, uh, speaking to the people who actually run the place rather than canvassing the opinions who are desperate to make a few quid out of it? But, but what would you tell him? Were you lucky enough or unlucky enough to have him sitting in front of you today. Uh, Saya is in Bristol to kick things off. Saya, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. Hello. I'm really nervous, so Why? I might stumble on my words. What are you nervous <laughs> about? Is there anything I can um, do to put you at your ease? Would you like a cup of no. tea? Are you sure? Oh, a yoghurt? I've, really, I've had plenty of tea. No, Would no, you like a coconut okay. yoghurt? I've got a coconut oh. yoghurt I can share with you if you want. <laughs> no, What's on your mind, you. Saya? What's on your mind? So, I, based on uh, my experience, my personal experience, I think a centralised database, you know, where the, um, the data is shared between hospitals and GPs, because at the moment, from my experience, there's a disconnect. So I'll give you an example. My father, who had... Um, 
blood, a form of blood cancer. But during his time, you know, there were times when we had to take him over to A and E because his nose would bleed or something would happen, yes. and I have to rush him to A and E. Now, you know, you've waited three hours. Dad's really weak, and then I have the nurse asking me a barrage of questions around, okay, w- what's going on with him? And I knew there were a lot of underlying issues, but I'm not medically trained. Sure. And I would, you know, I could say, could I just give you his NHS number, and can you not just look it up? And she said, no, we don't have that. It's all in- with your GP. And when I called the GP to say, can you share his data? It was because of the GDPR, the Data Confidentiality Act. They had to hear it from dad, but dad was barely conscious. So I just put the phone in dad's ear and I just said, just say yes. Just say yes to everything they're asking because (laughs) they need your permission to share the data. They're not going to listen to me. So they're just silly things like that, you know. Um, I I wonder whether, I I, I mean, the technology, because all of us, I don't really do it. Yeah, but I know people who do, who've got everything, not just the actual official health data, but also the unofficial stuff that your phone can track. Everything It might have everything on there from mm. blood pressure readings, body mass index. If you use a smart watch, it's going to have all manner mm. of information on there that the NHS doesn't have access to either. So I, I think I understand mm. where they're coming from, including um, Tony Blair, actually, when they talk about the role that AI can play and the role that technology can play. But I thought mm. they tried to do what you describe. And it, they and did. It, and the project failed. That, yeah. and, it, and I didn't know that it was we were still living with the consequences of that failure. We are. And it even gets worse. So I recently was in hospital where a nurse, I think I was getting prepped up for a minor surgery and she had to do all these, you know, she had to do some blood tests and yeah. all this stuff. But I came in with all my history, my health history as well. And the nurse was telling me that she has to input every injection just that she's used of me. She has to input a barcode. They don't have scanners. She had to manually oh, input the numbers. We need to hear this from the other side, don't we? We need to get nurses and doctors yeah. to tell us what, the, the, the reality I, of what you're describing from heart, their point of view. Yeah, my heart broke for her because I thought, wow, you've got a lot to put in there. And she said, yeah, manually. We all have to do this manually. After you leave, this is what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> no? I wonder whether uh, we actually should only listen to medical staff because patients are, are only going to be able to answer half of the question, aren't they? So, yeah. I mean, that, no, that sounds wrong because I'm very grateful for your contribution, but I now need to know mm. what a nurse, what that nurse that you've just described thinks about what you've just said. Yeah, yeah. It'll, I'll be so curious because um, I know I, you know, she said to me she has to manually, because I said, can you not just scan stuff? And she said, no, we can't do that. You have to go into a computer, manually put in stuff. And this is to Even protect your test. data. So that is why, first call yeah. in, you've, you've unraveled this headline for me when I said, what are these privacy fears I'm supposed to be worried about? And, and the Ooh. answer is the reason why they can't do Ooh. what you've just described is because of privacy fears, is because of, uh, well, also perhaps a lack of appetite historically, but that, that is why they can't just wave a magic wand and do it tomorrow. So you have miraculously knitted together at least five of the roads that I spent 20 minutes this morning explaining that I couldn't decide between as, as the way into our conversation about the broader issues of the NHS. You're right, we can walk down several roads at the same time. Just in case you weren't confused enough by my goalpost analogy, we're now walking down several roads at the same time. But Sire is right, isn't she? I and mean, clearly, the obvious impact and improvement that would be provided by a centralized database so that everybody working in the NHS types in your NHS number and up comes everything. So what are we supposed to be worried about? Answers include insurance companies getting hold of that information, hackers getting hold of that information, or um, uh, it being used, that information being used to look at the hereditary possibility of some illnesses, which, again, could be detrimental to to patients, um, whether through an insurance point of view or even a treatment point of view. I like that. So doctors and nurses views on similar themes, please. 03456060973. David is in Binfield in Berkshire. David, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. I'd like to say, quite simply, we talk too much, first of all, about money and budgetary restraints. And we shouldn't be focused on that. What we should be doing is focusing on the 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 pinch points, in other words, the resources that are encapsulated within the NHS. So there will be resource limitations. And what we tend to do is talk too much about the money restraints rather than the resource constraints. I, I need you to, to just expand a bit on that point. I sense this is something you know more about than I do. So, so because at first glance... I would say to you if I was feeling punchy, but every single resource that you're talking about would have a cost attached to it, and therefore the restraint on a resource is actually a financial restraint. 
Uh, those are self-imposed financial restraints. This is a longer conversation, James, regarding uh, modern monetary theory, which I can go into. But no, I'm no, sure crikey, you don't I was asking to. you to simplify things, mate, and you've just I, dived. You've just that, dived into no, a sort of Keynesian meta-analysis. I'm, I, I, no, what, what do you mean when no, you use these words? That's all I'm asking. I'm not going to go down that route, which Good. is what I was trying to say. I, but so what do you, you mean? What do you actually mean in layman's terms when you talk about resource limits like that? Well, for, for instance, let's look at an MRI scanner or a CT scanner or whatever. Now, are we short of scanners or are we short of the people to operate the scanners? OK. Unless you're clear on that, it's pointless buying more scanners. And, and what are your qualifications? Exist- I, I know this isn't mystery hour, but how, how do I know that that's a valid concern? Because, again, my immediate response would be well, whether you're short of scanners or people, it, the only way you're going to get more scanners or more people is by spending more money. You're right. You have to spend more money. But once, uh, in terms of an investment for the future... In other words, you're spending some money that's hopefully going to return, give you a return on your expenditure. So you mean more intelligent targeting of of resources or funds, whatever you prefer to call them? Because if I'm running a hospital and I can't do as many scans as I want, I can't get the waiting list for scans down, I'm going to know what the problem is. Uh, You would hope so, but that, that problem will vary depending on where you are in the country as well. Because you may you may be able to get uh, lots uh, plenty of staff in nice rural areas, yeah. which was which we see with GPs. I fortunately live in a nice area, yes. uh, but it, once you start going into some of the inner cities where GPs don't want to work, then you've got a shortage of GPs there. Now. So that so these things might involve. I, I, I think you've distracted me slightly, and I haven't got time to explore it further with that with that contradiction, almost as if they were two different things: resources and finances. Because immediately, I'm thinking with your final point, I'm thinking, well, you're going to have to make the package more attractive for a GP in an area that is less popular, where people are less keen to work. The package is going to be have to have to be more attractive than it is, for example, in Binfield. But that package would involve money, and the GP would be the resource. So I, I look forward to our deeper conversation about monetary policy. Um, uh, but, but, but for now, I don't know how... Hell, I'm going to call it a perforated line between the two rather than, a, rather than a red line. David, thank you. Alistair is in St. Albans. Alistair, what made you pick up the phone? Um, a couple of a couple of reasons. Uh, one, on. thank you for having me on. I'm You're sure this welcome. is quite busy. Um, <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> my, my, thank you. Um, my, two things. First thing is, uh, me and my partner are currently going through. Uh, we went through IVF um, on the NHS, which was incredible. Yeah. Um, to have our first child, um, everything kind of went well and um, officially pregnant five months ago. Oh, good um, Living God. in Saint. Oh, thank you. Um, first things first, we had a choice of two hospitals to go to. Uh, Watford General and the new QE2 over in Welland Garden City. Our first kind of like um, appointment that we had was uh, with the midwife and stuff was over in the QE2. And my partner and I were given a really nice kind of folder and pack with loads of paperwork and stuff in it. And then we had a scan over at Welland Garden City. No, sorry, um, in Watford, in Watford General. Um, And they didn't quite know how to deal with uh, the pack full of papers and paperwork and forms. Oh, that so we've this is a recurring theme then. This, they is, were this working is extraordinary. On a digital system. Okay. Um, and the thing that baffles me the most, more than anything in the world, in a day and age of Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and stuff, where everyone is using the same, like the same platform, billions of people across the world. Why on earth in the NHS can't there be just one system that logs all of our medical history and one... I'll one tell you. I'll tell you why. Wait in there. Scotland can log into the same one. I know it's run by different trusts. No, no, no. I, I will hear from Scotland about what, what goes on there from, from a Scottish caller. But um, I'm going to find you the... Do, 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 streeting move to allay patients' fears over Big Brother oversight of private records. So there's a fear of a Big Brother oversight of private records Uh, it could be a target for hackers it could breach your privacy Um, that I think we breach our own privacy every day when we post on Instagram and Facebook and all the rest of it when we're sharing a million and one fake or true story you don't don't post details you don't post details of your sperm count or how many eggs were harvested in your last (laughs) round of IVF do you no, we don't. Well, I mean, some no. people do. I wrote the an article for the Daily Mail about mine, national, mate, so I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the fact we don't have a national system for yes. the NHS to use instead of in paperwork is just archaic. 
it's just absolutely archaic where one hospital and another one just can't log in. And, and I, with, it, yeah, even uh, though I have, you know, I, 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 quite a few dealings with the NHS, for various sort of reasons of family members, not, not I don't think above average, certainly not for someone my mum's age, but I am surprised by what I'm hearing in that context. And it makes the idea of opposition to, well, it makes two things ridiculous at first glance, opposition to so-called passports for all patients, almost every call so far and most of the texts addressing the madness of this system. Was it the spine? Does anyone remember? Didn't they call it the spine? Weren't they supposed to do this 20 years ago? Or 10 years ago. Is that, so did we just give up on it? Is, it? is it like what they tried to do with HS2? What the Tories tried to do with HS2? Spend millions and millions and billions and gazillions and trillions of pounds on it and then just sort of forget about it and hope we wouldn't notice. Is that what happened? Someone could be able to tell me. And can doctors and nurses, can, can medical professionals talk to me a little bit about this, this notion of the passport, which so far is top of the list of things that you would tell West Streeting need to be done in the next 10 years in order to massively improve the NHS. And, and don't forget, the Daily Mail's furious that, that, that they're asking people like you what you want and, uh, and what you think is necessary, especially if you're a medical professional. Absolute waste of time and money. Why are you asking medical professionals? Just ask me. It's 10.31. And Thomas Watts is here with your headline. It's a beautiful word. And I speak of someone who got the word onanists, plural, onto a Scrabble board last night and hoovered up 77 points in the process. Um, I can't tell you what it means, Keith. No, sorry. Uh, Ofcom would be absolutely livid. You'll have to look it up. But sclerotic is a beautiful word. I, I, I mean, it's not a beautiful thing. It's a horrible thing. Sclerosis, of course, is, um, comes from the same root, having a sclerosis. But, but in the non-medical context, sclerotic is a description of, of a, a kind of management, or you could use it, to describe a management that just is a system rather than a management, because management is people. Nobody would sit here, I don't think, and say it's really important that doctors and nurses struggle to find out information about their patients and we absolutely shouldn't make it easier for them to do so. But the system described to me so far has sounded sclerotic and I, I, I do have time. The phones are very busy, but line nine is currently free for a doctor or a nurse to talk to me about this um, uh, I, because I sit here every day talking about important issues and... I learn that actually, in plain sight, one of the biggest problems with the NHS is obvious and common. But then I read a, a quote on the front page of The Guardian saying the proposals are a gift to stalkers who misuse NHS systems. So the idea that we wave a magic wand and, and deliver passports for all patients is perhaps not the no-brainer that it currently looks like. And that's not, um, that's not the only answer that you can provide to the question as, as, as Wes Streeting and Keir Starmer ask you what you think the NHS needs to do in order to get back towards where it was in 2010 that's my phraseology not theirs what what other answers would you provide Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Dave's been in touch he's currently sitting in the garden in Biggin Hill he says I can't phone in right now James but I wouldn't mind a little coconut yogurt it was only a, it was a one-time offer, I'm afraid, uh, Dave, and, and uh, it was it was for Sire only that that invitation. Ten thirty-six is the time. Joel is in Ealing. Joel, what made you Hi, pick James, up the phone? Well, um, so back in 2011, I actually was diagnosed with cancer, and I um, I eventually, you know, was fully cured, all better now. Fantastic. But the biggest concern I have is that I think genuinely believe if I got diagnosed today. I wouldn't be here or, you know, it would, my treatment plan would have fallen apart in some way. And I just think it's so deeply concerned and I find myself... Being why do you, why do you think that? Because that's quite scary. And remember, there will be people listening yeah. who are being diagnosed today and, and, and in yeah, the last... So what, and, and, and so what do you think has changed? Well, I think fundamentally, like, it just seems so efficient, like, from diagnosis to being on my first treatment, it was like three weeks. And granted, I was up in the north, and I was all, I was in one particular trust, and they just took control of everything. Okay. And they were like, "You're you're with us. We're going to treat we're going to treat you, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And I, and, I, and it was great. You know, I mean, obviously, what I went through was really bad, mm. <laughs> but it was great in the terms of the, the treatment plan and the outcome. And more recently, um, I'm now and that was when I was living up north. And more recently, I'm now in London. And when I pop into the hospital, I had to go in really recently for, for an issue I had with my foot. Yes. I had to tell them everything, all my medical oh, history. This is amazing. I had to be well, cognizant of it, yeah. and that changed drastically the treatment plan they gave me. You know How what they had in mind originally, and then when I told them my information, they were like, 
oh, well, OK, because of that, we now can't do this, this and this. I'm sorry. And But they'd sent me away at first and called me back to come in to change everything just a couple of days later. How surprised were you by that? Really surprised. Oh, thank goodness for that, because I'm worried I'm sounding. Change. I'm worried I'm sounding stupid. I'm worried everyone listening is going, yeah, duh. Of course that's what. But actually, everyone is surprised when they come up against it. And because I don't think I've ever come up against it, I'm not. Mm. I'm not aware of it. And and I've, I've I must have done a hundred NHS phone-ins over the years. So so the person that you meet, the person that is treating you, is only able to access all of the information they need to treat you effectively after jumping through a hoop or two, depending upon whether they've got the scanner for the barcode or whether they have to enter it manually mm. and all manner of other issues, and having your permission, which is what I didn't fully understand about Saya's call, the first call, when she said she had to sort of hold the phone next to her dad's face and just tell him to say yes to everything. Otherwise, yeah. they wouldn't have had access and to the information. So what? What do we know what the historical justification for that is is it the, the fear of privacy being breached why wouldn't they all just, or, or is it just incompetence they tried to build a system that would do this and they failed i think it's probably the former and i and i can anecdotally talk about that as well like my father's now been diagnosed with alzheimer's oh, and gosh. you know the, the, the thing that i've experienced recently with the nhs is that i need to be aware of all my information yes and when you have someone who's got alzheimer's bless him he, he's not aware of you know what he had for dinner of anymore course, so i i've had to get a power of attorneys in place and get all the information that so i have it so that when we need to take him to the hospital i can authorize things give them all the information yeah. and bypass that caller's issue that you had previously because just telling him to say yes you know he doesn't know what he's saying yes to well, he, and, he, he was it. I mean, he he, he, did, he wasn't mentally impaired. I think he was, except briefly or temporarily mentally impaired, as a consequence of the illness that he was seeking seeking treatment for. Uh, blood cancer, I think, Sire said. But certainly, sort of, you turn up at A&E because you've got bad nosebleeds and you might be a little bit delirious and you can't... I'm very surprised by this. Uh, but we've taken it all so far from the patient side of the uh, uh, system, of the service. And I... I, I you know, if it stays that way, that's fine. We've all learned a lot. But but from a doctor's and nurse's point of view, A, have you heard anything you'd like to challenge? I don't see how you, well, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but everyone has clearly been talking to us in good faith. And B, how have we ended up? And why am I so naive? I thought my NHS app did some of the stuff that we've been talking about today, but it, but it doesn't, of course. Uh, I might be able to see everything that's on it, but you won't. And think about three things, all right? Just three little things as we have a conversation about data. Think about your age. Think about your weight or your body mass index. Not the same thing, of course. And think about your ethnicity. And then think what a doctor can do with those three things in order to identify whether or not you are more likely to be at risk of something than not. All three of those things. Age, weight, ethnicity. And, and that's data. That's data. And it's data that you can establish when someone is sitting in front of you. But think of all the data that you could be carrying on, on, a, on an NHS passport that is automatically crunched the minute you sit down in a, in a medical context. I, 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 listen, it sounds like a no-brainer to me. And quite often on the program, when I think it's a no-brainer, it turns out it's a massive brainer. And my brain is not big enough to deal with the size of the brain that you need to deal with it. So is it actually a no-brainer? I don't know. Gareth is in Warwick. Gareth, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, Gareth. Mm, big fan. I'm a um, healthcare industry consultant. I've been working in uh, health since uh, the early 2000s. Okay. On the numbers of, of projects like the ones that you've been talking about on the spine and various things like that. And then I, I would say that um, there's a lot of hysteria about kind of privatisation of hospitals, like that people don't really understand that the NH, the, the GP surgery, the private businesses, and yes. they are actually privatising the NHS by stealth. So what I would encourage... With, it's, not a with great, the, it's not a great <laughs> phone line, sadly, so I'm going to have to limit you to two very punchy sentences, Gareth, unless the phone miraculously improves. Okay. So I, I, I would, um, I, I would uh, re-nationalise GP surgeries because, quite frankly, they're, they're, they're the private businesses and they, they privatise the NHS by stealth. Well, and, I, I'm familiar with so that I'm, phrase. I, I understand the, 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 the funding of, of GP. How would that improve the experience of the average patient? Uh, because um, it would mean that they're not uh, busy um, competing to take services away from hospitals and pharmacies, which are rapidly closing down on the high street because... 
GP surgeries are busy opening up dispensaries, right, in the surgeries. It, it, it would give them a core purpose and a core um, and a core mission to, to treat patients on the front line, right? I don't know. I, I mean, it's yes. I, I mean, I'd, I'd need a little bit more um, than that. I, I, I'm not per- personally familiar with a shortage of pharmacies, but then I live in a, a very populous area of, of West London. Um, I, I, there's, we've got two within walking distance of my front door, but I appreciate that wouldn't be the experience everywhere, and neither of them are in the in the local GP surgery. So I, I don't know to, to to undertake a massive reversal of something that doesn't, and it may be as you say because people don't fully understand the issues, but something that doesn't at the moment beep on many radars as as one of the most obvious problems with the way the NHS is currently being run. We'd, we'd have to um, um, uh, we'd have to live and learn. So it's coming up to quarter to eleven. A lot of you sharing my shock at the uh, extraordinary, extraordinarily sclerotic nature of the system when it comes to your health records. What are we supposed to be worried about? Why would it not be a no-brainer to stick everything on a microchip? That's a figure of speech, obviously. I'm not completely Luddite. Stick everything on a microchip, stick everything on an app, stick everything on a digital record so that wherever you are and whoever you are, the minute you identify yourself to a healthcare professional, they know absolutely everything about you. I'm sure there are things I'm supposed to be worried about. I'm sure that this line on the front page of The Guardian, the proposals are a gift to stalkers who misuse NHS systems, makes sense. But I want it in your words. What, what are we supposed to be worried about? It's 10.45. 10.47 is the time. I'm going to start inviting you into my confidence a little more than I do already. So, c- crucial question when we're considering a conversation that we might have together, that, that Eleanor and I will, will thrash out together in the morning, will be what, what might a caller say? So we're trying to find out, is this going to be interesting or not? What might a caller say? And there are loads and loads of topics. I, I don't want to embarrass anybody by running through what they are. But there are loads of topics where I could guarantee that an awful lot of people would have something to say and absolutely none of it would be interesting. For example, on today's phone-in about the NHS, um, I don't know whether or not anyone has rung in to tell me that there are too many managers in the NHS. But if you pay even the slightest bit of attention to the facts, you would know that that's not true. You would know that less than 3%... Um, Even 10 years ago, of the total NHS workforce were managers. You'd know that the decline is close to 20%. You'd know that the King's Fund believes that the NHS is undermanaged rather than overmanaged. You'd know that comparing the number or the percentage of so-called managers in the NHS to other countries finds that that England or, 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 or even the United Kingdom in general, but particularly England, has one of the lowest proportions of managers to healthcare professionals. But it's a lazy right wing trope. But it's not interesting. I never know how much time I should dedicate to doing lazy right-wing tropes because my job, of course, is to diffuse them. Um, but, but in terms of what would a caller say, that's often a way we can establish whether or not it's going to be a question that's worth asking. Don't know the answer to this one. White Britons are dying faster than minorities. Lifestyle choices such as drinking and smoking could be behind cultural divide in mortality rates. Why do you think that white Britons, despite, and this is crucial, Despite being better off, and remember, this is a statistical generalization, so despite being better off, why would you be more likely to die than other ethnic minorities? With one exception, actually. People with a Bangladeshi background who live in smaller towns and cities were found to die at a slightly higher rate than white Britain. So I don't know what the answer to that would be. I thought, could it be our Viking heritage? Could, could it be our Saxon heritage that we're drinking all that mead? But why would you smoke more? Why would you be more likely to smoke if you're a white Briton? Example, I don't know. So do you see, I, so it might be interesting. Can't currently see it at the moment. Didn't see the consensus when asking you about what needs to be done to the NHS, that data collection and data um, access is apparently a huge problem. But I need to hear it more from... NHS professionals. I just do, just to check, you know, think of it as a, as a peer-reviewed process. John's in Manchester. John, what made you pick up the phone? Oh, hi, James. Hello, uh, John. Yeah, unfortunately, I won't be giving you too much information about uh, the data side of things. That's, no, but, that's uh, fine. That's only one part of the conversation. Yeah, so I, I, I'm bringing up today on behalf of uh, the Manchester Early Intervention Service Unite in Unison reps. Um, we're on strike at the moment, actually, focusing on trying to improve services for people with severe and enduring mental health difficulties. Is, so, is, that, is that specific to Manchester or is it nationwide? 
it's specific to Manchester, but we believe that the problems that we're trying to highlight are relevant across the, the country. You mentioned deaths, actually, James, yes. which is obviously pretty distressing, but uh, people with severe and enduring mental health difficulties, we've known for decades that the life expectancy is around 59 for men and yeah. uh, 67 for, for women. Uh, we know that 72 families are going to be burying a loved one today um, uh, because of preventable illnesses. Um, so I suppose one of the potential reasons um, that people might be dying young is because of their mental health difficulties. Yes. Um, your last caller, James, he, he had a bad line, but he had a good point about uh, privatisation by stealth. And uh, I, we think that if you want a, a case study in Tory privatisation efforts, then you should have a look at Manchester Mental Health Services, because the situation at the moment is appalling here. And uh, we, we're, we're spending huge amounts of money on private hospital beds out of area, and we're spending very little indeed on the preventative important stuff like our early intervention and psychosis service. Would, would try and to and this, is, the, the, this is at odds with that somewhat optimistic analysis I, I, I shared at the opening of the programme, where you can see the role of the private sector in dealing with short-term problems like massive waiting lists. But the NHS... Uh, has a historical role as providing permanent support for problems that will always be there. Uh, uh, and and if you start trying to farm that out to the NHS, then the economic imperatives are, are, are guaranteed to see the actual situation deteriorate. So I, I, I'm, I'm reading about your case. Um, uh, you, there's a strike and then you're going to work to rule for a while uh, because you believe that staffing levels are unsafe. I, I, I don't want to um, steer you away from why you rang in, but why would privatisation by stealth have rendered your staffing levels uh, as early intervention workers employed by Greater Manchester Mental Health NHS Foundation Trust unsafe? Um, I, I suppose one of the, the biggest challenges is that central government really have shortchanged the region in terms of budget. Right. That means that it's a tiny pool of money and, and at the end of every year the private um, healthcare companies will come in with their bill of 10 to 30 million. Once the commissioners pay that out then there's very little money left for anything else and that has to be shared okay. around fairly deprived services as it is so there's just no money left for our uh, for the staff that we need to do the job that we want to do so so it's a, it's a contributory factor to a broader problem rather than the root cause of the problem that you're striking over you're striking over a shortage of staff indeed we're striking over a shortage of staff and the the, the evidence backs us up in terms well, how of do we know you know, and and i'm sorry i didn't know more about this before you rang in but how do we know that the staff are there waiting to be hired if that doesn't sound like a silly question we don't, James. No. And that's one of the big problems, really, is that the, the, the previous administration have underinvested in, in all parts of the system. Um, and and the, the small little points of hope that we have, yes. one, one example would be clinical psychologists. They, they, they increased the placements and the training for clinical psychologists. I think they've almost doubled it. It's not huge numbers. Sure. But last, last year, there was approximately, say, about 30 people qualified in Manchester, and only four of them then ended up working in the local NHS. So it, it, it's, it's just a problem system-wide. But can I give you one example, James? Of course of, you can, John. Of, yeah, in terms of, because uh, we've, we've been trying our best to avoid this strike action, and one of the things we've been doing is you know, research to try and demonstrate how effective early intervention is. Yes. One, one yes. of our care coordinators, now a care coordinator is either a nurse, a social worker, or an occupational therapist. If they pay for one care coordinator, we save 197 hospital bed days. Now that equates to £85,000 in costs if it's an NHS bed, but it's up to £250,000 in costs if it's a private healthcare bed. Okay. Now the, the local NHS have actually uh, just, uh, they're just about to open a brand new hospital and replace the old one. Now that's good news, but the bad news about it is that there's 16 less hospital beds. So they're, they're, they've reduced the number of hospital beds. Now nobody wants people in hospital, but with community services in such an appalling state, um, it, it really kind of begs the question, what is the long-term goal here and how are we going to use private hospitals and how are we going to get back to invest in, well, in early you, you ab Absolutely central to almost every conversation we have uh, uh, about matters health-related, about the NHS in particular. I, I think the myth, or not even the myth, but the fundamental problem is that the private sector arrives in the public sector promising to do the same job for less money by bringing in efficiencies or lessons learned in the commercial sector. But of course, given that they're 
take home, given that their profit, given that their motivation is financial, then the temptation to actually do less work and keep more money is something that would need to be um, policed to the to the point of paranoia uh, to to ensure that it actually happened. That, that, but it, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's impossible. But I think we'd all need an awful lot of persuading. You're in negotiations with the moment at the moment with the trust. What what does what does yeah. success look like, John? Well, uh, speaking of paranoia, uh, there's, there's this <laughs> wonderful sound of thing at the moment called the community transformation that's happening. Now, remember, this is severe and enduring uh, mental health difficulties. So, so it's different to primary care, it's secondary care. Yes. And, and people forget that politicians sometimes talk about, you know, kind of wonderful interventions and important interventions in other areas, but they've got absolutely nothing to do with our service. With but our no, service. just because I, 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 you'll understand, I've got a lot of people still waiting to talk to me about in the context of your current industrial action, what does a resolution look like? What does success look like? look like uh, we want uh, we want a significant investment in the region. Uh, Manchester Early Intervention Team were identified by the NHS England of having 1.03 million ring fenced money that should have been spent in our service that was not because the situation is so bad in Greater Manchester that money all goes into one pot and gets spread around as best they can, but they can't do a good enough job and they can't focus on prevention. So uh, the Early Intervention Services and the community mental health teams need huge investment. We've got one percent of the population of community mental health teams and we get pretty much zero percent of the funding of all of these 975 million and 2.5 billion that politicians dazzle us with. So, I, I guess there'd be reasons for that, won't there? You've, you've identified one of the biggest, which is perhaps a prioritisation of private provision, but I, also the, 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 you know, the stuff that politicians want to announce, the ribbons that they want to cut, I don't know I, I, whether or not the sector you work in, which is of absolutely inexpressible importance, is, is one that historically gets politicians excited and that's something that politicians need to fix because you can't you're doing your best already often in impossible circumstances john thank you i hope you don't feel unduly curtailed but um i did want to they're going to leave a lot of people not able to contribute i wanted to squeeze in at least one more and it's jennifer who's in lancaster jennifer what would you like to say hi james hello um, i'm nervous too i'll have some coconut yogurt please <laughs> <laughs> i've run out now keith at it all Aww. carry on what made you pick up the phone um, so I'm a newly qualified nurse. I've oh, been um, working in our very busy surgical ward in the Cute Trust for the last 16 weeks. Yes. And um, I just can't, even as a student nurse, I don't think I could really grasp how impossible the job is. It is so hard. I'm rushed off my feet all the time. I think that people is absolutely what we need. We need more nurses. We need more healthcare assistants because... It's that simple to you. It is, because even if I go into the ward and uh, the whole team are there, everyone that's meant to be rostered on has arrived and turned up for the shift, they're all well. The chances are one is going to be taken and moved to another ward that isn't fully staffed. And so then we're a nurse down. And so whoever was meant to be nurse in charge is then in a bay. They've got eight patients to look after. And then me, as the newly qualified, I'm in a bay with my eight patients. And I haven't got the support that I might need because everybody... (laughs) Is working at full capacity. Are you so are, are you enjoying elements of the job? I am enjoying elements. Thank God for I that. I think it's <laughs> I think it's you know it's a wonderful profession to be part of. I love being part of the wider MDT. I love the diversity yes. of the team around me. I love the diversity of the patients. But I can't at the moment. Well, I can't sustain what I'm doing for much longer. I reckon I've probably got a year in me in my current job. Um, and I only work part time. <laughs> yes, sure. I do have two small cho- two small children to look after. Oh, my I understand, are. but but your life—the easier your life is, the more you would be able to. Not easier. That's the wrong way of putting it. The, the better run the ward is, the longer your professional life would be. Definitely, and you know, it's a twelve and a half hour shift, and there are days where I'll barely take my break because I physically can't. If I don't do the work, someone else isn't going to do it for me. And we're talking about patient safety here like people could become extremely unwell if they don't get their medication on time and you yeah, know i want to yeah, sit there and I, I, hold I, people's hands and i can't do that John, very very <laughs> briefly on the data thing did you did you what did you think from the previous calls that you've listened to about, about how difficult yeah it's definitely all it's definitely that doesn't impact me as much because i suppose it's more the doctors by the time they reach that. you that's already been done by the time they're on but i am work. i'm using multiple systems when i'm at work i've got we have like um, iPads that we use for like admissions and a lot of like skin checks and medications. So that's all in one system. If I want to print out um, a label for a blood sample, that's on a different system. If we're looking at like um, blood 
results. That's yeah. another system. So there are all these different systems at play, and they're different to the other trusts within our region so and different to GPs. So. Really, yeah, different <laughs> trusts. I've got people who work in software telling me that getting the trust to agree with each other can sometimes be a problem. And of course, what Jennifer has done unintentionally is remind us of the enormous elephant that's been sitting in this room for the entirety of our conversation, which is that doing the data stuff would involve the private sector because there's no one in the NHS at the moment that's going to be able to deliver the, the, the kind of data passport system that West Streeting is keen to see. But again, it would be an ad hoc project. You'd come in, you'd do it, you'd clear off. Oh, boy. Um, thank you. It's 11.01. I, I've managed to complete just a little throwaway comment at the end of the last hour, and I can add the IT sector to all of the people that I've alienated irredeemably over the years. Look, I didn't mean you come in, you do it, and you clear off. Obviously, some people need to stay behind to run the thing that you've done, but in the context of delivering an enormous new data system, then uh, 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 the, 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 the job would be self-contained, and then the job of maintenance and uh, and 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 kind of looking after it moving forward would be i'm not still digging I, this is they're, they're two different things but please stop bombarding i'm very sorry to the to the entire it profession software development you name it i'm very sorry i didn't mean to suggest that it your a that your job is easy and b that you don't need to remain on the job so to speak long after the original job has has been completed um I think I'm going to do this one, actually, even though I can't think of answers that you're going to give. I did get one, but it was it was pure idiot's corner. Let me see if I can find it. I'll, I'll give me a second. Um, I, I do, why do we think that there are higher death rates for white people in Britain than there are for ethnic minorities? Um, and it is attributed to drinking and smoking habits. You know, I'm a great believer that the world would be a much happier place if we spent a little bit more time trying to understand each other and recognise what we have in common than we do accepting the invitations of uh, certain public figures and, and so-called politicians to despise each other and keep attacking um, uh, each other on the grounds of our differences. So, for example, people of Chinese ethnicity are going to die about a third fewer than white Britons. I, you've got to be so careful not to engage in lazy generalizations now, haven't you? Because I, I work on the fringes of Chinatown. I wander through Chinatown in London most days. And I would say that I see more people smoking in Chinatown than I do almost anywhere else that I, that I spend a lot of time. But then where do I spend a lot of time? You know, walking up Brentford High Street or, or uh, sitting at a, a railway station with a ticket for my destination. So I, I guess that's the only place where I routinely see people who are stepping out of their workplace. I, I see it downstairs. I see colleagues. I don't know if I should mention any names who like to step outside for a, for a crafty smoke early in the morning, but I don't. So I, I, this is just interesting to me. Why do you think that white Britons are dying faster than minorities? There's a crucial point here, despite being better off. So it means that if you grow up in a family like mine or possibly like, and, and actually I'd be really interested in what the um, what, what you as a member of an ethnic minority in the United Kingdom think the answer to this question might be. I don't, I don't want to open up any culture wars, but when you look at the amount that white British people drink and smoke, do you find yourself going, flip pen act, do they not do they not read the news? Do they not listen to the to the NHS warnings? So if you look at London, for example, which is the town I currently know best, the Office of National Statistics has found that nine hundred and sixty three white Britons out of every hundred thousand would die in a year. Um, for families of Pakistani heritage, that figure drops to 834. And for Chinese ethnicity, it drops to 612, more than a third fewer than white Britons. And this covers the period from March 2021 to May 2023. And it's got the controls for differences in age and the absolute um, number of people in each ethnic group. So the answer cannot be... Obviously, more white Britons are dying because there are more white Britons in the UK by a country mile than there are anybody else, than there are from any other grouping. So that is not the answer. You take, you take a selection of ethnic groupings in this country and the wealthiest one, well, could that be the reason? Everybody else would be dying at the same rate as white Britons if they could afford to. 
But I don't think that's going to be the reason. But it's just what you do when you start looking at statistics like this. So despite being better off, generally speaking, the white British cohort is more likely to die as a consequence of lifestyle choices such as drinking and smoking. Um, hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 6060 973. This could tie in with so many other conversations that we have because it won't just be drinking and smoking, will it? It might be diet. I, 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 I find myself, now that we're emerging from the sort of dog days of austerity and 14 years of Tory rule, I know, I know that the impacts aren't over or anything like that, but the people in charge at least want to do a better job rather than um, giving no intention or no impression whatsoever of wanting to, to make the country a better place for ordinary people as opposed for, for, for themselves and their donors. I do find the way that we're zoning in on certain areas together really interesting. The things that are popping up even when you don't expect them to. Food is going to be huge, isn't it? So uh, how much of that could be true? Where we talk about what, what would you pin down as a typically British cuisine? And the, and the roadside food that we have compared in recent weeks, the experience that you'd get in France or in Italy um, than, than that you would get anywhere else is absolutely inconceivable. Um, also, perhaps, you know, if you're believing the lies of, of race agitators, if you, here's one, for a generation, says James, whites have been overlooked in this country. So if you're believing builds like that, maybe you're so angry and confused by the modern world that you are more likely to turn to alcohol or you are more likely to not be paying attention to um, public health messaging because you've been persuaded that somehow public health is against you or that you are a, a, a victim of some terrible conspiracy. I don't know. I'm thinking out loud because the, the, the mystery to me is pretty profound. The question is, is a pretty serious. There is something known as the healthy migrant effect. People who migrate, and very often they are doing so for economic reasons, they tend to be more healthy and fit. So that ties in with my point about the racists, because they like to talk about fighting age men instead of healthy working age men. So could it be that because if you're coming here from somewhere else to work, um, you are more likely to be healthy and fit because you want to be able to make a, a, a big contribution, earn a decent crust when you get here. Whereas the people we should be worrying about, the people whose health is going to be a drain upon the economy and therefore need more help getting healthier... Uh, they are more likely to be white Britons. So, again, it turns on its head the traditional right-wing tropes that the, current is that the country is currently being held hostage to. But I don't know that that would apply to second or third generation. So when you get to second generation UK-born ethnic minority groups, they start adopting the lifestyle similar to the white Britons. So they may take up smoking and so on and actually lead a less healthy lifestyle than their parents. So so there are two questions here. The first is, is this. Why would a white Brit be more likely to drink and smoke and die from it than almost anybody else in the country? I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. 0345 6060 What would you point to? And I, I don't want, honestly, I don't want this to be a... a um, a tense conversation but if you are from an ethnic minority background can we try to have this conversation in the same way that we talked about what somebody who's spent a lot of time overseas thinks about the food that's available in our motorway service stations so we've had really powerful public health leadership on things like smoking we've had you know smoking bans we've had brilliant campaigns to improve our public health. And yet the cohort of the population that seems to have been reached least by this are the ones to whom it has been most obviously directed. So why would white Britons die faster than minorities despite generally, and these are all generalizations, despite being better off. Here are the numbers now. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. Chris wonders how many of these people might have died of heart attacks while reading the Daily Mail or the Daily Telegraph. I'm not being completely facetious but when I suggest to you that if you believed the narrative of Nigel Farage or if you believed what you're being told in the Daily Mail or the Daily Telegraph about your state 
about your country, I, I, I think you would be more likely to suffer from high blood pressure, from anger issues. Possibly you'd be more likely to seek escape in the bottom of a bottle. If you were believing the lines that you're constantly being fed about everything from the National Trust right through to um, uh, population demographics, then maybe you would find yourself being more depressed and more prone to bad lifestyle choices as a consequence of, of that of that anxiety and that depression. Does that, is that going to wash? I know Chris sent that in as a joke. I know Chris sent that in as a joke, but the more I think about it, the more possible, because the numbers aren't 963 out of 100,000, and take it to Pakistani families, it comes down to 834, so it's going down by over 100. If you're constantly, I don't know, if you're constantly being fed a bogus diet of victimhood and um, conspiracy, then would you be more likely to make bad lifestyle choices? How much of it crosses over? If you've been fed nonsense about everything from immigration to climate science, are you more likely to not believe national health messaging? Are you, are you going to think that all authority is against you? Are you going to actually believe if you've been persuaded that vaccines are bad for you? Are you going to... I'm, I'm possibly overthinking this one, but I'm just showing you how wide the goalposts are for your answers to the question of why you think white Britons die faster than minorities in this country, despite being better off. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. And I, I, no one's allowed to sound smug. But if you're not a white Briton, if you're an ethnic minority Briton, why do you think it is? What do you look at and think, flipping heck, lads, give your head a wobble, will you? You ate all the pies. 0345 6060 973. 18 minutes after 11 is the time. I, I tell you what I think part of the problem is. Part of the problem is the perverse sense of pride some people will feel when we contemplate elements of this story. So that little line that I did at the end there, that throwaway line about who ate all the pies... You know, we all, even those of us who, as we get older, take a little bit more care of ourselves than we used to do, we, we all kind of think it's funny, don't we, to do Greg's jokes or to imagine what life would be like living on sausage rolls. I, is this part of the reason why white Britons are dying faster than minorities due in part to their lifestyle choices? Because we do think it's funny. We did it with stags the other, uh, other week. We were talking about stag nights. And there was a sort of... I don't want to say pride, not in the horrible stories, but when the, the, the young lady who rang in from, or had been in Latvia or Estonia, when 30, 40 Smurfs turned up at the bottom of the road. And you know for a fact that would be a British group. And you also know for a fact that they would all have been absolutely blotto. And we still think that's kind of funny, right? Even perhaps kind of cool. I'll tell you what I'd really like to hear about in the context of this conversation. A, an ethnic minority family where first generation are paragons of health. So mum and dad or grandma and granddad, everything is home cooked, no smoking, hardly any booze or no booze, whether for relig religious reasons or otherwise. Um, plenty of Christian denominations, of course, that, that um, eschew alcohol. It doesn't have to be, I nearly said it doesn't have to be a Middle Eastern religion, but if Christianity is not a Middle Eastern religion, then nothing is. So it, it, that, that, that matriarch and patriarch of the family Paragons of health, first generation immigrants, absolute paragons of health, second generation, third. By the time you get to the grandchildren, you've got a kind of ethnic minority Vicky Pollard situation going on. Smoking, effing, jeffing, drinking, the whole, the whole. What's that? To watch that happen would be interesting. But let's look at some of the reasons why. Why would you be more likely to die of your lifestyle choices if you are a white Briton, despite being better off than the ethnic minorities who are largely living longer? Dylan is in Loughton. Dylan, what made you pick up the phone? Uh, hi, James. How are we doing? Very well, mate. What's on your mind? Um, just the topic, really. I know what you just said around um, having the first generation very healthy. I've somewhat been in the inverse, so... I'm third generation on my dad's side. My granddad was from Cyprus, and obviously over there they have a bigger uh, smoking culture. And I think so. He died from lung well, cancer. Don't, don't say obviously. I I, I didn't know that. Is, is smoking a bigger Apologies. deal in Cyprus than it is over here? Um, I w I wouldn't have the stats to say sure. either way, but that's that's from my perception. 
But um, yeah, he passed away from lung cancer, I'm and sorry. I think it worked in the inverse. It happened. I think it worked in the inverse where that then taught my dad the thing to teach me to keep me away from smoking and drinking. So from time to time I drink, but I've never smoked. I've got no cigarette in my life. And um, just in this country, I think it is very part of the culture in regards to the society, in regards to like social and the working environment. Yeah, but that's the same for everybody, isn't it? Yeah, but I feel like well, the working environment. What are you like? How much do you? What are your lifestyle choices like compared to your dad? Um, pretty well. He's taught me to eat well. Do you smoke? smoke and drink. No. But the point I'm making is more around you work hard Monday to Friday so that then on the weekend you can go to the pub. I think the pub culture in this country is a big one regarding that. And I think that is white dominated. Obviously, you have your um, like mixture between cultures within there. But I think that is a big part of it. And you're kind of indoctrinated that from a young age. As in you, you, to, to be part of the gang, you go out on the lash yeah, smoking that, is rebellious and cool. Does that that doesn't really apply to your generation? But then your generation probably isn't dying at the rate that the older generation is. They they've struggled to get rid of the idea that smoking and drinking. Did your dad forgive me? I, I don't want to pry because you've lost him recently. But did your dad drink a lot as well? No, sir. I haven't lost my dad. I lost my granddad. Oh, your granddad. Forgive me. Okay, so oh, I see. And so your dad is has, has gone in the other direction then. Your yeah. your, your family, generationally speaking. Yeah. That's really interesting, isn't it? And and it, it's about what you arrive with and whether you change. So generationally, you're seeing an improvement, whereas I guess if you were coming from a Pakistani background or an Asian background, then you'd be seeing the opposite. Your fam- you'd be more likely in your generation to have adopted some of the bad habits that your parents and your grandparents' generation found um, uh, 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 unpalatable or, or, or even incomprehensible. Thank you, Dylan. I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. 0345 6060 Can you pin it down? Um, the, the, the idea that this disparity can be partly blamed on lifestyles with smoking and drinking far more common among this group than among people from ethnic minority backgrounds. Vina Rale is an epidemiologist at the King's Fund and um, told the Daily Telegraph, who report this quite well today, I've said to you before, the news pages of the Daily Telegraph are as yet largely unpolluted by the absolute madness that passes for comment journalism on their opinion pages. Broadly speaking, we find that ethnic minority groups in the UK have lower mortality and therefore higher life expectancy than the white British population. They have lower rates of smoking and alcohol consumption, so they have slightly better lifestyles. Why? Speak to me as somebody who is um, very much uh, white British culturally and, uh, and ethnically as to why people like me are more likely to make these lifestyle choices than, for example, people like you. Louis in Dartford. Louis, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Yeah, it was just on this topic. Um, one thing that I thought was quite interesting was the age at which sort of our my white counterparts were taking part in drinking and drugs. And a lot of the time it came from the 80s of year 9 and year 10 right. on a Friday, seeing them out. And just, you know, not sounding horrible or racial or anything like that, but I just remember being a thing amongst my friends is knowing that that's what white people do. They go out on Friday from a young age and they take drink and drugs and we just never did that. Um, Of course, obviously, subsequently, some of us did end up getting involved in drink and some drugs, but even on the sort of drugs aspect, there was a clear line between these are black people drugs, these are white people drugs. And I think... Really? Yeah. There was, like, for example, cocaine isn't something that black people do, although there are black people who do that. It's just not... It's just not something that a lot of black people would do as compared to say white people and i think that plus the age at which it started from um probably has something to to do with it and and where does that come from i mean i remember i'm older than you so i, yeah. I i'm not subject to the same pressures but why why, yeah. why would you not all be going out to the pub together on a friday I, night I, 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 again i'm not quite sure why but again it's sort of i think it was the age thing as opposed to i mean right now of course I'll have my friends that we may go out to a while, but even 
now I have friends of obviously all types of cultures and there is a difference between the cultures and the type of alcohol and drugs that they consume. That's really um, interesting. So yeah. I like this because here's the, the Tories are right, James. All these foreigners really are eroding our pure British values. How dare they not drink and smoke themselves to death like the white majority <laughs> are, which is obviously unhelpful. But you're how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm 34. So you're yeah, so you are 20 years younger than me and you're seeing similar reflections generationally than because I thought this might be confined to older generations, but booze culture and, and yeah. Friday. So I t- I, yeah, some people are going to disagree with you, aren't they? They're going to say, well, I, I'm in the pub or I'm clubbing on a Friday and a Saturday night. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like a reflection of modern Britain now. The idea that there's some sort of, you know, booze apartheid down the middle of, down the, middle of the dance floor, is, 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 it, it, I, I, it's not going to be the whole answer to this question. No, but I, but I, I definitely think it's to do with when it started. What um, about health? I, what about broader health issues? How, how, how much um, more likely is a young black Brit to be eating worse or better than a young white Brit? If indeed that is a valid yeah, distinction to make. Again, and this is a sort of conversation I have amongst sort of my friends as is well. It? Because, yeah, because uh, it's easy to turn around and say, you know, in England or in Britain, there's a lot more processed food. But in the same way, in sort of Caribbean culture or African culture, there's food that's high in oil and high in salt and Very high true. in other things that yeah. are bad. So, in our culture, we've got high, you know, blood pressure and diabetes, and there's there's other illnesses that we get due to what we consume that are probably different to what white people consume. And I don't know whether it's a better or worse type of thing. It's just different symptoms because we have different diets. And I, I guess with each generation, we move towards a more homogenous experience um, as the. Uh, influence of countries of, of origin parents grandparents countries of origin begins to fade we move towards a more homogenous experience and we should all be worried about that because the homogenous experience if the majority experience is the one that is seeing people die sooner um it's coming up to eleven twenty-eight. thank you louis this is really interesting there'll be as many answers to these questions as there are people listening and then some so i don't know that we're going to go definitive or, or go right or wrong on it but goodness me it's food for thought isn't it if you pardon the pun. John's in Broxbourne. John, what made you pick up the phone? Yeah, I picked up the phone today. Um, thanks for taking my call, by the way. Um, just because I think one of the issues we've got is, is diet-related, and I've seen it. I'm, I'm half Greek Cypriot. My dad's a Greek Cypriot. My mum's English. They've right. got completely different diets. Uh, my mum's actually got, got stage four cancer, oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, which we've put down to basically just food related, um, you, you know, uh, <sighs> completely different diet. And, really? and I think are they still together? Got, are they together? No, my dad actually passed away not long ago, to be oh, honest I'm, with you. I'm sorry, um, but were but they was, together? They was, didn't eat different meals in the same at the same table, did they? In the, in the... They, ate, they, ate, they ate different meals. My dad was my, my dad was 83 when, uh, 84 when he passed. My mum's 70. 73 they've had completely different diets all their life wow. um my dad pretty much was you know uh, not really any health issues sure um uh, and, and then you know my mum's had health issues all of her life with inflammation in the body and all sorts of stuff breast cancer um uh, you know now she's got lung cancer um so, and it, and from what we can see like you know from what i can see the 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 the, the Western diet yeah. is 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 terrible. We've got high salt, high sugars, um, lots of you know, processed food. So, you're, what would your dad do? Would your dad cook his own food? Uh, yeah, mainly. Yeah, he, a lot of you know, uh, grilled fish, grilled chicken, pulses, vegetables. Uh, plenty of olive oil, and and I see it firsthand coming from both it's cultures. Really interesting. I see that the diet in you know the Mediterranean diet and and the levels of. Um, you know, disease that that culture has compared to other other cultures, and and it's the same with the Chinese. You're talking about the Chinese mortality rate being low. Well, they don't eat the same food that we eat. So you're talking about a, a difference in cultures. Well, one of the main differences you've got is is the food diet. And obviously, the better your diet, the better your ability to counteract cancers. If you're smoking, if you're two cultures smoke, and you've got one culture that has a good diet and one culture that smokes and has a bad diet. The culture that has a bad diet and smokes is more likely to get lung cancer because the body's ability to fight um, so, the mutation you? in the yeah, first place. Yeah, no, you're bang on. And, and that, of course, is oddly absent from this analysis, but it, it must be the single most important factor in, as you say, comparing two people with the same bad habits but different diets... You're going to come. You're going to come up against the conclusion that you've come up against. I'm very interested to know what you do, which which parent you've followed, or whether you do a little bit of both. No, I, I completely changed my head. Like I was, you know, I, I was 17 and a half stone. 
I had I was in and out of, of doctors and hospitals with chronic acid heartburn. I suffered from GERD where I was waking up in the middle of the night choking through oh. acid. I was in and out of the, the doctors. They just prescribed me for 10, nearly 10 years on antacid pills. Right. I was living on Rene and Nexium. About three years ago, I lost five stone. I completely changed my diet. And within less than a week, my heartburn had gone. I've never had it since in over three years now. I'm 12% body fat. I go to the gym four times a week. My diet has completely changed. I only eat whole foods now, no processed foods, no Amazing. sugar, and I feel better than I've ever done. So we're talking about, you know, cancer rates now. It used to be in the 50s, one, two got cancer. Now it's, you know, uh, sorry, one in five got cancer. One, mm. and now it's one in two people getting cancer. You're talking about the, the, the drug coming out to help fight a beast. We've got a real problem in this country with diet. And, and, and it's a problem that you are more likely to be exposed to if you are from a white British background. It's not, I mean, it's not even confusing when you say it like that. There are other factors to it. If you're from a Bangladeshi or a Pakistani background, you are more likely to die from diabetes, stroke or kidney disease. So, you know, that there are going to be some genetic inheritances here. But in terms of behavioural inheritance it's it's a bit of a no-brainer really isn't it why, why do you think that is i mean I, I, apart from the obvious geographical origins and your your dad would eat the language of his uh, not the language he would eat the diet of his mum wouldn't he he would he would try and recreate the he food would, that he i think it's it's the culture of food and it's it's what we're subjected to as well like obviously we've got a, our food industry in the uk is completely different to other 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 countries we look at this you know food in the uk it's driven by corporations it's driven and if you haven't got a, a strong cultural language of food at home you're going to be more susceptible to the corporate to the language of corporatization outside home i think of course and and Gosh. you know you had a call you had a caller on earlier talking about mental health issues yes well if you do the research and look at how diet affects mental health um, you, can, you can almost eradicate mental health from the food that you're eating because of your body's natural ability to combat... Not quite. I, I understand the point that you're making, but there'll be plenty of people listening. I just have to acknowledge that there'll be lots of people listening with, with, with awful mental health who really do their very, very best to look after themselves. But I understand precisely the point that you're making and the statistics support the central thrust of your argument. Briefly, if I may, what, what made you turn that corner? What made you grasp that nettle? Well, I went. I went private, and yeah. uh, and and when they when they examined me, the the, the, the surgeon or the, the the consultant basically said, "Look, I'm, I'm going to be frank with you." He said, "If you don't change your diet, you're going to end up with cancer." I already had a, a hiatus hernia in my esophagus, and Oof. he said, "You're going to you're going to end up with cancer if you don't change how you're eating, change your lifestyle." Um, I don't. How old I, were you I, when that happened? Uh, a forty. 40, 45. You've got a much younger voice. Until you told me how old your old man was when he <laughs> passed away, I, I thought I was talking to a 20-something there. Maybe that's no, down no, to no, diet I'm as well, John. Now. Maybe, Maybe if you'd phoned yeah. in 10 years ago, you'd have sounded like Doc Cotton's little brother. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, I know it is, you're right. It all speaks to the same thing. And oddly, because I'm obsessed with things like this, you tie that in with the conversation we were having in the last hour, you shouldn't have to go private to get a message like that, should you? It's 11.34. Thomas Watts has your headlines. 11.37 is the time. It, it, the numbers are not negligible. Uh, neither are they death sentences, except perhaps the contrast between people of Chinese ethnicity and people of white British ethnicity, where the gap's pretty huge. So 963 people out of a group of 100,000 would die in a year if they're white British. That figure drops to 612 if they were Chinese British. And it has been adjusted for age and overall numbers. So there is no answer to this question that involves pointing out there. It's not what I call the Ian Duncan Smith school of statistics. I always remember a million years ago when uh, conservative politicians would still appear occasionally on this program. Ian Duncan Smith came on to tell me that there were more people in work than ever before, not as a percentage, but as a total to which I thought the only reasonable response was to point out there were more people alive than ever before. I, I, I mean, the idea that more white Britons are dying than any other minority, if you were just counting them, then it would be uh, utterly unremarkable. But you're not. You're, you're doing a per 100,000, and you're concluding that white Brits are much more likely. Is it, I mean, why, given the 
preponderance these days, the proliferation these days of good public health messaging. I know there's nowhere near as public health mes- as much public health messaging as there is advertising encouraging you to do bad things. But are we more likely to suffer from denial? Are we more likely to, to think that, you know, the reason why we're unhealthy is not our fault or it's nothing to do with us? I, d- I honestly don't know. Ricardo is in Felton. Ricardo, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Long time no speak. Okay. Um, a little bit nervous. We'll see what we can do. No, you're not. <laughs> so uh, I've got two points. One is kind of tongue, tongue in cheek and one's a little bit more serious. Yeah, so, go on. Tongue in cheek answer is, you know, there's a well known trade in the black community that white people need alcohol to have fun and black people need food to have fun. It's when you have. I've not heard that pop. before. I've never heard that not. before. No. Yeah, and so if we're going to a social gathering, either a birthday or maybe something more sad, we'll always bring a dish or food or things like that. Whereas uh, white people tend to bring bottles of wine or kind of they need alcohol to have fun. So I think a few callers back, someone said, like, at the end of a. <coughs> a week at work, they'll go to the pub on a Friday. But that's just not as common in, in my culture anyway, uh, as a black male. Well, I never, I know, yeah. I mean, now you come to mention it, I suppose, in fact, a couple of people nodding in the in the studio, they're, they're familiar with that phrase. I've, I've just never heard it before. And then... Well, did you uh, know? Was, I've got, I, yeah, I, I mean, it's a mate of mine from school who's Nigerian and all of his Facebook stuff is food-based. All of it. He's like a, a massive king of barbecuing. And, and I... I, I that that is obviously for him. That's his contribution to all family gatherings and all sort of cultural cultural occasions. Whereas yeah, for, can... for, for an Anglo-Saxon background, you're right. You'd think that if there was a party to be had or a, or a wake to attend, then your first thought would be the bar, wouldn't it? Maybe. Yeah, we bond over food more. Mm. And on a more serious note... Um, that was pretty serious, you... actually. Now you come to oh, actually well, we'll air it. Then. Um, yeah, go on. There's a phrase uh, that people of my age, I'm uh, in my mid-30s, yeah. People will say, um, the phrase white girl drunk, which is a description of people being at a ridiculous state of intoxication. And that isn't that isn't a black girl drunk, that is a that is related to race. And the reason for that is because black people kind of represent their culture when they're out and about. And so when you're out in public and you do something that might be slightly silly or whatever, you kind of represent your entire culture, whereas white people don't have that. That's all kind of a little bit of white privilege. Yeah. And I think a great example um, would be the grooming gang- gangs in Rotherham. Some people saw that story as like indicative of that race, which of sure. course it isn't, and yet the abuse in the Catholic Church isn't tarred all with white men. And so we have to be more careful when we're out in public because we think that people will rightly, so excuse me wrongly, but they people will judge our entire culture based on our our individual actions whereas in the phrase white girl drunk it's you know they only represent I, themselves I, that i mean crikey I, I i don't know that i could have knitted all that together in the way that you have done but it, it's i mean it's plausible when you describe it in those ways so look at that typical black behavior yeah. over there i can't imagine anyone would ever say typical white behavior no exactly Good grief. I, you know, I'm today years old when I've got my head around that idea, Ricardo, for which I, I'm not going to apologise because we can only ever deal with what's put in front of us. But particularly, I mean, obviously, as someone who was raised in the Catholic Church and, and um, uh, attended schools where sexual abuse of children was absolutely rife, the idea that I would somehow be tarred with that in the way that anybody of, of Pakistani heritage in the hands of... I don't even need to list the names of the people who've got themselves rich and famous off the back of that kind of propaganda and lies. Mm. That They try and target every person of Pakistani heritage with the crimes of a tiny percentage. Good Lord. Um, Thank you. And so you would be less likely, therefore, to get absolutely steaming drunk when you're out in public because you'd be conscious of somehow stigma and stereotype. But we just don't have to either. Like, we don't need that. Well, very um, few people do. The term in Sheffield, Nick tells me, is white girl wasted. I've never heard that before. Some people will be at first glance upset by it, but you need to think about exactly what Ricardo has said. You shouldn't get upset by it unless you're buying into the idea that that passes judgment on all white people, which, of course, it doesn't, (laughs) which is why it happens, which is really quite um, fascinating. Thank you, Ricardo. It's coming up to quarter to 12. Speaking of the people who put enormous effort into spreading racial division and... uh, and, and fermenting the kind of hatreds and, and animosities that seem more popular now than they have at any point in the 20 years I've been presenting this program. I should tell you, I've got a guest coming in after the next junction who has undertaken an extraordinary undercover investigation. You'll be able to see it on television last night, looking at uh, just some of the tentacles of far-right influence in this country and be- beyond. And it involved proper... I've seen the film. I've had a sneak preview of it. It involved serious um, 
personal risk in order to get into the spaces where you could witness and, and see people saying things that perhaps we all suspected were being said, but which it is perilously hard to secure evidence of. So stand by for that, whatever you do. Um, squeeze in Nitin, who's in Amersham. Nitin, what would you like to say? Hi, uh, hi James, first time caller. Welcome. Um, I <laughs> just wanted to add on to your point about uh, the ethnicity of why Asians, uh, especially you, you mentioned a couple of times Pakistani group, mm. but I think that, that one of the reasons could be is that when Asians start getting diseases in their 50s and 60s, they're normally diseases, i.e. diabetes or heart disease, which actually now have a cure or at least to extend life. Whereas when Caucasians in the main get diseases, they're normally cancerous or related of that ilk and therefore terminal. And so that, that also would add to your number. Because wow. I, I know in my own family, I, I'm uh, second generation, and all of my uh, parents' generation, they all lived into their 80s and plus. And the new generation, I, in my generation, none of them, they're all in their 60s, and yeah. a, quite a few have passed in their 50s, purely because they, well, I would say a white disease, i.e. Uh, prostate cancer of those types, which you didn't hear of in India or Asian subcontinent. As much. Because of diet, probably. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because our so diet, all roads, you know, all roads lead to diet, don't they? Yeah, and I think, and I think that would add to a lot of the statements that were made earlier. You know, if you add in the alcohol, better health, um, etc., they all obviously would. Because Asians don't have good diets. I mean, let's face it. Sure. You know, if you just have it's to go ghee. on Diwali coming up. It's the ghee, isn't know, it? The ghee and the. Uh, <laughs> All the all the uh, you know Bombay mixes and stuff. Yeah. It's all fried. Yeah. So it can't you know we can't. But be smoking is lower well. in uh, South Asian groups than almost anywhere else, and strong cultural factors also in relation to alcohol. How yeah. how much does alcohol seep into a family from generations? Do you drink more than your dad would have done? Well, I personally don't drink. But well, the, there you the, go. But the, but the thing is, I think your point earlier about generationally. I'm now my children are third generation technically. And in that group, their drinking is equivalent to their white peer part. Uh, their That's equivalent. what I wondered. That's what I wondered. So which which I, speaks to your point about things coming, not in a good way, but but about the the, the ground leveling in front of us, or or, or a, a, a kind of coalescing on the centre ground. The homogenous experience would be increasingly unhealthy, uh, albeit. Um, as you say, Bangladeshi, Pakistani backgrounds would lead to a higher rate of diabetes, strokes and, and kidney disease, which are more easily addressed than some of the lifestyle related conditions that perhaps are more obviously fatal. And absolutely fascinating. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, Harry Shookman joins me next, uh, an undercover investigator with Hope Not Hate, who um, has been on an extraordinary mission to examine the darker underbelly of um, what is currently being done or what some people are currently trying to do to our population. It's 11.47. 10 minutes to 12 is the time. A quick shout to Adam, who proves my point, really, about us taking a sort of perverse glee in some of these health legacies. He says, blooming heck, James, you're making me feel guilty. I'm trying to eat a bacon and cheese turnover over here. That's not really the attitude, Adam, but I don't know. I would take bets on what your ethnicity would be, and I suspect it's likely to be identical to mine. And it is ethnicity in an entirely different light that we turn our attention to next. Um, let me get you to stick a, uh, an appointment in your diary, although uh, that suggests that, of course, everybody else still watches television in a linear fashion, which increasingly is not the case. But 10 o'clock tonight, Channel 4, Undercover, Exposing the Far Right, a documentary made with the Hope Not Hate organisation, looking at, well, all manner of things that we'll talk about shortly. But here's a little taste. It's a mixture of keeping people safe and also understanding, you know, what gives the far right their power. Far right often present one image to the world, and what they're saying when they think no one's listening is different. And we have to be in the room when they think no one's listening. Their ideas encourage violence, even if they're not explicitly calling for it. And that's something all of us want to stop. Well, they're not just sending us horrible messages on social media. He's gone and bought a gun. Um, it's an extraordinary piece of uh, of work, which I had an early look at. Uh, it, it changed a little bit since then because, well, partly, I think, uh, because of the uh, race riots. Some people, of course, refer to them as the Farage riots that were ripping through towns and cities in the UK this summer, ju just as I saw an early cut of this film, which makes it all the more urgent that some of the questions posed 
in the film and beyond are answered. It, it involved an investigator called Harry Shookman going undercover. You, you, you just heard one of the Hope Not Hate people there talking about the necessity of being in the room where these conversations are being held, and, and Harry joins me now. So it's a very brave but also slightly odd thing for a young man to end up doing, Harry. So how did it happen to you? Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, I'm a journalist. Uh, before I was working at Hope Not Hate, I was a freelancer living in Manchester looking at how the strange confluence of anti-vaxxers and far-right activists were working together. This was at the pandemic or just after it. And I was becoming really concerned about new ways that the far-right were mobilising in this country, targeting refugees, asylum seekers, migrants in, in their accommodation and building this new momentum. Um, I really wanted to look at what is giving the far right its new oomph. You know, the make, they make up a majority of referrals to the Prevent Counter Radicalization Programme and a majority of terrorism convictions in this country. So there's never been a more urgent time to try and understand and hopefully disrupt what they're doing. And that involved you pretending to be sympathetic to their cause and infiltrating, which I think is the only word we could use, um, some organisations that are known to the general public, some that have run for office in this country, and some that are not or were not. So let, let's begin with the first category. What did you do in that field? So I pretended to be uh, a guy called Chris and I joined a few far-right groups in this country, one of which was Britain First, a far-right political party run by Paul Golding, a former BNP activist. And he believes in what he calls a strategy of the ballot and the boot, a combination of really aggressive street activism and electoral politics. And so I joined them when they were campaigning in their local elections in spring last year. And what I saw inside the organisation was way more extreme than what I could have imagined, much more extreme than what the organisation tries to present to the wider world. What, what offended you or surprised you the most? The thing that, I, um, the thing that really shocked me when uh, I was joining a canvassing session at the by-election in Tamworth late last year was the activists gathering to make anti-Semitic jokes that are unrepeatable on air, unfortunately. You are at great risk when you do things like this, at risk of exposure, most obviously, but the... Um, Adrenaline must pump at, at a rate of knots. Yeah, it was like living on a diet of pure cortisol. The only way I can sort of describe it is, you know, that feeling when you're about to slip over on an icy pavement or you step onto the road and you suddenly notice that a car is speeding towards you. It's like that in your head all the time. Uh, Golding in particular has uh, got a conviction, I think, for headbutting a man in a nightclub um, uh, as well as breaking a court order on entering mosques. Um, I, I guess... I choose my words carefully, people won't be enormously shocked to discover some of what you found out went on behind closed doors. I'm publicly very careful to avoid the anti-Semitism that always goes hand in hand with these kind of um, eugenic related views or these very much race related views. Also, the desire to see this country while simultaneously claiming to be patriotic the expressed desire to see the country suffer all manner of privations and horrors because that helps create an environment in which this kind of poison can flourish. You got that on tape as well, I think. Exactly. Um, I don't think I can repeat the clip on no, air, but um, Paul... <laughs> you can see it at 10 o'clock tonight. You can it's see it at there. 10 o'clock tonight. Um, but to, to summarise it, um, when Paul thought that no one um, unfriendly was listening, he confided to me once in a pub after a day of leafleting that he wanted to see this country descend into, uh, to paraphrase it, let's call it a nightmare, um, so that that would give people um, inspiration to, to vote for him or support him or donate him. And ultimately, what he really wants is donations from people. Um, yeah, I don't they all. Um, and then we come to the thing that I found closer to almost Hollywood style um, revelation. When you when you went undercover with uh, a group that looks into race, a bogus race science. Uh, it was it, it, there's a history to this. Uh, students of this kind of um, stuff will be familiar with the phrase pioneer fund which was pro-nazi believed to be defunct subscribed to notions of the master race at its simplest and turned out not to be entirely defunct at all and not only that 
And when I watched it, the identity of the person that you um, identify was still, I think the lawyers, I watched an early cut, I know now that name is in, but you find someone who's funding a really big modern day eugenics movement. That is absolutely chilling. That's the stuff of, as I say, of, 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 of you know, novels and, and, and movies, but this is happening in real time under our noses. It was a huge, huge surprise when we discovered this name. I mean, um, I was spending time um, undercover in this group called the Human Diversity Foundation, which tries to push debunked race science into the mainstream. And unfortunately, they are enjoying some success at the moment. Um, and they had bandied about this name of a, a wealthy investor who had made his money in Silicon Valley. And, you know, they were fond of saying that his donation of $1.3 million was just a rounding error on his net worth. And it took a lot of effort to try and get this name uh, out. And we were, my colleague Patrick Hermansen and I were really proud when we did ultimately discover that it was the inventor of a dating website called Adult Friend Finder, um, who's called Andrew Conroe. And that speaks to the depth, if you like, of the organisation because the thing I found breathtaking was the structure that was in place and the number of people that were working to do, to do what, Jack? To get into public discourse, to get into the mainstream stuff that would have delighted Joseph Goebbels and Adolf Hitler. Right, I think that um, had the original race scientist who made the Pioneer Fund been alive today, they would have seen a lot to be proud with in uh, in the Human Diversity Foundation. Um, unfortunately, the the ideas of race science um, that were so popular in Nazi Germany um, and indeed in 20th century America, where a lot of forced sterilizations took place, have never really gone away. Do you know, um, I was reading up a little earlier before you came in about the 61-year-old um, man who has died in jail, one of the rioters from this summer, convicted of violent disorder. And he was described by his own lawyer as a conspiracy theorist who had a conspiracy theory against anyone and any form of authority, referencing the deep state, referencing NASA, um, being opposed to the police, being opposed to journalists, being opposed to civil servants, police chiefs, the environment agency, and none of the people responsible for introducing this poison into Peter Lynch's life, and I, I'm not defending his actions, but you can mourn the passing of a fellow human in objective terms. None of the people responsible for that will ever be anywhere near a courtroom, let alone a prison without work like the work that you do. Well, that's uh, that's very kind of you to say. I mean, I think that trying to draw out some of these organisations that are operating in secret is really, really important. And to know that there are people pushing some really pernicious ideas into the mainstream and are, as I said, unfortunately, getting making some headway. Um, and what about you? Because you can't do this again. This is a, a, And it was fascinating watching some of your interactions with Patrick as well, who kind of mentored you. But he'd done similar work in the past. This is, I mean, really, you, you are all, by definition, one-hit wonders, aren't you? The, the kind of reporters who go undercover into this kind of context. So um, what, what do you do next? How do you ever, I don't use my words responsibly, how, how do you ever have that kind of level of, of excitement and satisfaction again? I don't think I'm going to be. Miss, I'm, I don't miss being undercover. Um, it was, it's an enormous relief to to hang up my uh, my secret camera. Um, I'm going to be getting on with the the day to day work at Hope Not Hate, which is um, opposing fascism in all its forms. And you can find out more, of course, um, about Hope Not Hate by watching the the documentary this evening. Also looking at some of the work in other fields with much more familiar names to people who listen to this program there's also a couple of your colleagues of course have been on full disclosure most recently nick lowell's the ceo of hope not hate who um has uh, pursued this work like you at great personal risk i should read what a spokesman for conru said when he was approached for comment um he said that he had helped to fund the hdf project that's the human diversity foundation at the beginning but that it now quotes appears to have deviated from its initial objective and the motivation for his funding which was to, mo to promote free and non-partisan academic research they said that he rejected racism and discrimination and he was unaware of the involvement of a, of a designated right-wing extremist and added in response to the information you've provided he has cut ties with the human diversity foundation ceased his funding and ordered immediate review of government 
governance processes across all of his philanthropic activities to ensure such a situation does not arise. Again, you can find chapter and verse on the situation that did arise at 10 o'clock tonight on Channel 4. What happens if you bump into any of these people again? I and mean, there's a particularly powerful scene in a, in a restaurant, isn't there, where um, uh, you, you are really on the brink of discovering the identity of the person who's bankrolling all of this. And, and you know, you have to win the trust of these people. They begin to think, A, they're 50% trying to impress you and 50% thinking that you might be able to throw a few quid. They've always got the begging bowl out of these people. It's absolutely extraordinary. Um, what happens if you bump into one of them again? Uh, that's why I'm, I'm trying not to think about too much, but it's all going to come up again next year. Um, I'm writing a book about, about what I did uh, called Year of the Rat out, out in May. And um, so I'm taking a lot of security um, precautions to try and keep a low profile until that time next year. Harry Shookman, I think, did I call you Jack a minute ago? I think if, if I did, I can only apologise. It wasn't even your undercover name, was it? it was that Chris. was Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Shookman, many thanks indeed, undercover. Well, no longer. I mean, now just an investigator and a journalist with Hope Not Hate. Your undercover days are presumably over. Thank God for that. As, as we've discussed, and thank God for you. Seriously, it's incredible work. I urge everybody to watch it. At, at 10 o'clock tonight. Three minutes after 12 is the time. 12.07 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we, we turn our attention next to, and now, as Monty Python used to say, and now for something completely different. Although I, I, I would stress that the um, that story of the man who has died in prison, the first of the uh, race rioters to have, to have died, and hopefully the last of the race rioters to die in prison, but the more you read into that article... He'd had a heart attack shortly before he got there. Um, the more you read into it, the more frustrating it becomes that, that the people responsible for making him believe the kind of stuff that saw him, um, that propelled him to that Holiday Inn in uh, 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 it was Rotherham, wasn't it? Uh, the, the people who peddle this kind of nonsense about the police, about the media, about the civil service, um, whatever it might be, about the NHS, they are very, very rarely anywhere near the uh, action when people like this end up either in prison or on this occasion worse. Um, just, just do bear that in mind next time they come around with their begging bowl. It's eight minutes after 12. I, I'm going to have a conversation about the royal family. Now, I, over the years, I'm doing this a lot. You must let me know if you don't like it. I don't know whether it's because we're all recalibrating slightly after becoming sort of de facto leaders of the opposition. No, not the opposition, leaders of the resistance during the massive misinformation campaigns of the last few years. So now, those are over. It may turn out that the current government are absolute wet wipes, but it won't be because they are desperately trying to funnel money into the, um, uh, the pockets of yacht brokers or Russian oligarchs. It will be for a whole heap of different reasons. So we, we can have a, um, uh, a, a recalibration. But as we do so, I find myself increasingly drawn to talking to you a bit more about how we decide what to talk about and how we choose the conversations that we're going to have. King Charles is in Australia. He had just finished an address to Australia's Parliament House on the second official day of his engagements in this country. Regardless of what you think about the royal family, King Charles has done about as well as anybody could have expected, not least when you consider the health uh, issues, the illness that he is suffering from and the difficulty of his inheritance and of course his daughter-in-law has been very poorly as well so I would suggest that if you and I were to be invited to sit in a room where they discuss how the monarchy has performed in under King Charles then everyone would be pretty delighted and relieved with the way that things have gone but it was towards the end of an address to Australia's Parliament House that an independent senator called Lydia Thorpe shouted you are not my king it was an interruption of the ceremony in the capital city, and it, which is Canberra, by the way. I don't know if you ever get caught out by that in pub quizzes or, 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 or games of trivia. Canberra is the capital of Australia. Not as many people think Sydney or even Melbourne, but Canberra is the capital. And her shouting continued for about a minute before she was escorted away by security. She is an Aboriginal Australian woman, First Nation, um, and therefore her claims about genocide against, quotes, our people carry weight. She could also be heard yelling, this is not your land, you are not my king. Another Aboriginal elder uh, had earlier welcomed King Charles 
and, and Queen Camilla and said that the protest was disrespectful, adding she does not speak for me. So I, I don't know that a, that a, a London-based radio station can have a, uh, a, a particularly powerful conversation about matters uh, Republican on the other side of the world. I, I'm generally pretty confident that when we dip our toe into matters international, there are enough people listening overseas or enough people here with their roots overseas to, to, to make it interesting or at least to make it popular, but populous, populated. But I don't know that that's what interests me the most because I'm looking at it and I, I'm fascinated by it. I, when I was reading into this last, which was a while ago, just so that I know what I'm talking about occasionally when I have the pleasure of your company in the morning. I, I, there, was a, there was a period, you know this, I should probably have double-checked it before I came on air, but there was a period towards the end of Queen Victoria's reign where republicanism was on a right roll. You wouldn't think that, would you? Republicanism in this country, we kind of, I guess, po probably deliberately always presented with the idea that it's a lunatic fringe that are opposed to the existence of the royal family, that the republican movement is both um, uh, small and unhinged, and that it's a very modern development. It's a sort of luxury of modernity. Um, I, I was fascinated to read about the ebb and flow of Republican sentiment in the 19th century. Uh, obviously, as the producer points out, we did once chop the head off a monarch. So to suggest that republicanism or anti-monarchy sentiment is confined to the 21st century. But look at how the Civil War gets taught in schools. You don't. It doesn't get taught as a you know a, a, a kind of as a precedent or proof that you can actually change your mind about having a royal family. It gets taught as a terrible aberration, as an appalling sort of and temporary misstep on the. Um, uh, 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 otherwise untrammeled progress of, of the royal family through society. So I thought it might be a moment. I will have a little listen at what she shouted, but I want to talk about, because he's not really my king either, and I like the fella, but I'm fascinated by what the future holds here. I can't really see... Nick had a really interesting guest on. What was the phrase that she used? A lazy republicanism. I think she spoke for much more than Australia when she described to Nick a lazy republicanism. I think the, the, the future of the royal family hinges upon one or two things. The first is most people no longer have strong feelings about it. And this is why historically it's not obvious phone in territory. When I started doing this job, we were coming towards the end of the period where people had really strong feelings about it. And then, of course, Diana, Princess of Wales, churned the waters extraordinarily. Such a powerful figure and such a, a powerful story as well, of course. Such a, such a, her life and her death um, focused the mind in unprecedented ways. But I don't think most people have strong views one way or the other. I don't think you really have many passionate royalists anymore, and they are the ones that often sound a little bit weird. No offence. And you don't have that many passionate Republicans anymore. And they are the ones who increasingly sound as if they're making perfect sense, but nobody can be bothered to give them their full-throated support. That's why next guest talking about lazy Republicanism really resonated with me. I hadn't, I hadn't heard that phrase before she had that sort of laconic australian delivery as well we're all lazy republicans mate which means look we know it's all a little bit ridiculous and and there's not much point but it's too much of a fuss to get rid of it which means we're going to have a phone in based on ambivalence which we hardly ever do all right oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number you need to tell me whether or not that's just about right now it's 2024 King Charles has come out of the blocks in impressive fashion. But really, this Australian senator notwithstanding, the idea that the royal family matters or that the royal family excites you, do you think it's going to survive the next... What number are you going to insert there? Okay, so what number would make you ring in? 25 years? Do you think the royal family is going to survive the next 25 years in its current form? 0345 6060973. 25 or 50? Or well, you can answer whichever way you prefer. But I, I, I increasingly don't. And I don't come from a position of passion or, or 
even particular investment, just watching the world as I do and trying some days to explain what I see to you and find out whether you see what I see or whether you see something very different, I don't think, I don't think that ambivalence is a recipe for survival. I don't think that the royal family can really justify its continuing existence if most of us now suffer from, for want of a better word, a form of lazy republicanism. You can't win an argument about why it's important to have the royal family. Uh, you really can't. You can try, but you'll sound a bit silly. You'll talk about tourism and someone else will mention that Egypt's done all right since they got rid of the pharaohs. People are still visiting the pyramids, aren't they? You can talk about having a head of state like Tony Blair if you didn't have the king. But look, for an ac accident of fate, you could have had King Andrew. Um, think about it. It's true. So that argument doesn't really work either. There are plenty of examples in the history of monarchy of um, unfit individuals rising up to the role I, I don't think ambivalence is a recipe for survival. So I, I put it to you that the royal family in its current form will probably not survive the next 50 years. 0345 973 And you can bring me the Australian angle if you want. Uh, when do you think that the Republican movement in Australia, a mate of mine actually used to run the Republican movement in Australia, would you believe? I should have given him a ring, but he's probably in bed. He used to, he's a, used to be a wallaby as well, former international rugby player for Australia. Lovely bloke, Pete. The um, um, question of whether or not you think in its current... Well, there's two questions. The first is, do you recognise my description of ambivalence, of lazy republicanism? Are you surprised to discover, after this subject matter used to be one of the hardy perennials of schoolboy debate and radio phoning, that actually... I'm a lazy Republican. It's a ridiculous notion. It's a daft institution, but it's too much it's too much fuss and palaver to get rid of it. But that level of ambivalence is categorically not um, a recipe for survival. 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. Uh, Gary writes, you're downgrading her protest, James. If someone from the other side of the world had come here 250 years ago and did to us what we did to them, um, then every time their head of state came sw swanning over here, what would you feel? I think you're right, Gary. I didn't mean to downgrade her protest. I, I simply meant to balance it with the comment of another Australian uh, uh, Aboriginal woman, Auntie Violet Sheridan, who had earlier welcomed the king. But, of course, L Lydia Thorpe is elected. She's a, an elected member of the Australian Parliament. So I don't know whether or not she speaks for more people than the person offered up as a balance. But, yeah, you're probably right. If it was the other way around, we'd be absolutely livid about it, wouldn't we? So let's do it from both sides. Let's do the Australian angle and the English angle. I think that this is one of those moments where you have gone, oh, yeah, you're right. I, I don't think you've given it enough thought to realise that you're actually a lazy Republican. I think in the moment, if I'd sort of caught you un, unawares and said, what do you think of the royal family? You'd have thought that you were in favour. But when push comes to shove, we are all lazy Republicans now. 0345 6060 973. 21 minutes after 12 is the time. And, and I mean, there is something there from Gary, actually. I think I was a little bit throwaway. Um, certainly saying English instead of British was very throwaway. I've got Dan Snow coming up on full disclosure in the next couple of weeks, and we've already recorded it. And the, the sort of broad lack of understanding of, of, of our own history, of British history, is never clearer than in the concept of monarchy and, and um, you know, what happened when Scotland and England came under the same crown. But the, but the, but the notion of what I've learnt today to call lazy republicanism possibly ignores, looking at some of your messages, possibly ignores the seriousness of the, the harm that it does. Let me read you something from Emma. Steve and Zoltan are up first. After them, it's a shame that uh, Steve's not called Adam because then we'd have A to Z on the switchboard in the space of the first two callers. <laughs> it's not often I get a Zoltan on the line. But w w Steve and Zoltan will be up first. Let me just read you this, though, from, from Emma because there's something here that I've never quite managed to properly articulate. My six-year-old is doing castles 
at the moment as a school topic. So we've had some chats about the English class system and the role of king versus servant and how, yes, servants are just as good as kings. And no, kings are not allowed to chop people's arms off anymore. He summated it as... I'm glad we don't have a bossy king anymore, and now we have a government. And I must say I agree. It's been a useful illustration for me, of, to a child, of the ridiculousness of the aristocracy, but aside from that, it has no real use. And I wonder whether there is an opposite argument to the idea that ambivalence is no recipe for survival. Maybe ambivalence is the only recipe for survival for the royal family. And in fact, what ambivalence does is blind us to the dangers. So what is so bad? Because this woman in Australia is making really powerful points about genocide and about exploitation and about land and about ownership, about sovereignty, if you like that word, in its proper sense rather than in its made-up sense of being used to persuade you to slap yourself in the face in the 2016 referendum. You are not my king. And we look at the anger and there's a temptation to be a bit smug about it and a bit sneering and a bit condescending. But a lot of her points apply here. So what is it about the royal family that we shouldn't be ambivalent about? For, for, for good or for ill, for positive or for negative. 0345 6060973. British, 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 British. All right. You don't need to send me any more messages telling me not to say English. British, 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 British. I suppose ultimately we could be talking about the whole Commonwealth. But to begin with, at least, we're not. Steve's in Thursk. Steve, what made you pick up the phone? I, I suppose I think the idea that this ambivalence is new, um, I, I don't really think that's the case. I think pe mo most people are indifferent, as you say. I think there's a small rump of the ultra-royalists, those sort of weird people who camp out on the mall and say things like, Andrew was just born at a strange time. Um, <laughs> he, um, and then there's, there's the people committed to republicanism. But then you look at you look at the question. It's people say, "Oh, I don't know." I, I'm, when you ask them, as you say, push comes to shove, they're not uh, they're not in favour of the monarchy. It's just that they're it doesn't mean they'd vote to get. It doesn't mean they'd vote to get rid of it. Well, exactly. But it's yeah. because of it's not because they love the monarchy. It's because they're not necessarily aware of the alternatives, or they don't know how the system currently works as it is. Or well, we don't spend the enough time about the damage that it does, as, a, as just as an existing institution, right. about the messages that it sends through yeah. every level of society. I mean, the Republican message essentially on on three basic points is is, is the three P's. It's wrong in principle. The palace, uh, as in how it is run at the moment, is, is corrupt and secretive and wastefully expensive. And then it's the third point, is it's corrupt. I, know that, I think corrupt is, I mean, I, I highly unlikely that anyone's going to sue me, but it would be me they sued and not you. So I don't think it, I can let corrupt go unchallenged, but, it, but secretive and the rest of it is fine. It, it would be corrupt in the sense of, a, morally, of using public you, money. You, you could say like morally corrupt, money. but corrupt in that sense speaks of, of, of criminal, criminality, which I know you're not suggesting. Oh, it, no, I'm not suggesting that, but uh, using public office for personal gain. I think that don't think that's uh, too far a thing to say. Um, but corrupting... It's not a bad deal that they've got, is it, in the, in the great well, scheme well, of things? No, well, I take well, your point, well, but they, I'm, just, I'm just a bit... I'm, I won't over-egg the pudding, but they're not, they're, no one's suggesting that there is corruption there in a, in a criminal sense. Um, no, but corruption doesn't have to be illegal. But um, it's uh, corrupting in the sense of what it does to our politics yeah, yes. I mean, and society. You know, why do we still have... Lords, why do we still have people bang on about Etonians, you know, and how awful they are? But yet, uh, as an example, how, how, how can we take a meaningful stand against unearned <laughs> privilege, whether it's inherited or not, if we still bend the knee for a monarch? Yeah, it's extraordinary. And, and why do you think you care? Why, why have you landed on, on what I would consider to be the right place, but that's against the backdrop of thinking that ambivalence is the more obvious and natural response. Why, why, I don't like doing phonies where I say, why do you care so much? But why do yeah. you care so much? I think, I mean, it's a long, well, to, to use a horrible cliche, like political journey. No, that's <laughs> not a horrible cliche. It's often a it's, precursor for a know, fascinating insight. I, I'd say I started in, in my family sort of slightly sort of on the centre left, you know, yeah. kind of believing in the, the NHS and, and all that jazz and, and, and freedom, liberalism and all that. And I just started to wonder over my lifetime, what is, what's going wrong? Why, why are things not working out the way they should be? Or what, what's not quite working? And I came back to start looking at the Constitution and the way yes. we do politics. Yes. And you can't not talk about our political system and, and the types of people we have and the institutions we have without going to the core. 
you can't not you can't just say every single change we just change the party in power but they've got the same access to the, the dodgy levers the past the, the the thing as the previous lot it, it it's and you, you wouldn't stop at westminster you'd carry on no. up the mail to the palace oh, uh, the whole thing getting rid of the monarchy isn't a silver bullet it would be um you know, it's a, a precursor to lots of political reform. So you would a, probably then, and I, I, I like it when pennies drop live on air, and this is my penny, not yours. In some ways, then, your analysis adds to the idea that ambivalence is actually a recipe for survival because the less we think yeah. about it, the less likely we are to end up where you have ended up as a consequence of thinking about it. Yes, I, wow. I'd say so. People just think it's a li- they oh, just think, oh they're harmless. They've got cups of tea. Oh, oh. Oh, the charity work, you know, but sort of not really charity work, but, you know, PR. Look the other way. Oh, it's sort of, oh, it's a bit nice. It's sort of like, well, you come on, grow up. <laughs> and what do you teach your children? I do remember being slightly perturbed with the concept of princesses and realising how much I loved it. I think Frozen has a lot to answer for, for my children's generation. But then suddenly realising that, you know, that, that they were buying into this notion of, entirely I, I, I mean i didn't sit in the cinema thinking this but princesses can i be a princess when i grow up and why can't you be a princess when you grow up because y- your realms of aspiration the parameters of ambition for you as someone born into your class with a lot of privilege compared to a lot of other kids there are doors there are paths there are roads that are entirely shut to you and that's not right that's not fair it's the liberal part of the um, of the country that I question most. I mean, yeah. I'm not surprised that conservative people support the monarchy. I mean, that goes without saying. Support the status it's quo. If you're on the right, right side of un- epic unfairness, you'd be there's a, an argument for yeah. suggesting you'd be mad to oppose it. But if you're on the left, I mean, to me, it's sort of questions. If you believe in democracy, mm. why not for the head of state? If you believe in equal rights, why do we? Why is a, a king still superior to a queen? Like it wasn't, it wasn't King Philip because the Queen outranked him because of he, she was the heir. We've got the Queen consort, but everyone drops it to Queen because the Queen doesn't outrank the King. And so, if you're a feminist, why are you still supporting no, I, it? I don't know that. I mean, you can't really be a feminist and a monarchist, can you? In, I mean, in really pure philosophical terms. Um, I love this. Thank you. I, I love the idea that ambivalence can be seen either as the greatest chance the royal family has for survival and the greatest chance the royal family has for redundancy. Um, this hasn't happened before, I don't think, Steve. Chris is listening. He says, I live in Fursk. Do you want to meet for a pint in the Crown and Anchor? You're bang on point. Absolutely, 100%, mate. See you there. <laughs> <laughs> it's 12.30 is the time. Uh, Jenny Barsby has your headlines. 12.34 is the time. How much of it is age? Do you say? How much of it is your age? So I remember the 1981 royal wedding. Uh, I remember it really clearly. I remember it as one of the seminal moments of my childhood. And uh, uh, No, not seminal, memorable. As in rememberable, in the sort of literal sense of the word memorable, because everything came to a stop. We had a big party at the local pub, which is now Flats. I don't know why that felt relevant to the observation, but the fountain in Low Haberley was a beautiful pub. You used to even have a, a skittle alley, would you believe, around the back. A proper old school pub, but it's Flats now. And the whole town stopped, the little village that I grew up in. Everybody went to the fountain. There were games. Uh, there, I, 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 went, I went, since you ask, I went as um, Jack Dempsey, the heavyweight boxing legend, because we were never big on costumes in my house, and I, I could go in swimming trunks and a dressing gown. Uh, and I won the running race. That was, I think that was the last time I ever won anything that involved physical exertion. And it was mad. It was it was it was absolutely bonkers. Every single person. I guess there were probably a few angry people sitting at home shouting at the telly. But I remember that in eighty one. Now in two thousand and eleven In the elemental surge with Thunder Rain Supreme. Clash of wheels, where lightning strikes with might When you in its course to darkness and to light The wings of wit unfold in victory or defeat Resolving 
got I got nothing. Have you? Were we together? Did we did we watch it together, you and me? Did was it on air? Was I on air that day? By the time it came for William and Kate's turn, I I just didn't feel to me. Would my children feel differently? I don't think they would. Is that the the way that I've raised them? Or has the country changed? I'm just thinking about the first caller saying there's always been ambivalence, and I'm not sure that's true. But is ambivalence going to bring about the end of the royal family? Or is it actually their best route to survival? Because the less you think about it, the more likely they are to make it. 12.36 is the time. Phone lines are open. Reese is in Watford. Reese, what would you like to say? Hey, James. Good, good to speak to you again. Likewise, Reese. Well, James, see, I've had a real interesting journey of my attitude towards the monarchy. I used to be a card-carrying Republican. Now I guess I would describe myself as a lazy Republican, as a lady said. Mm. But even though... The more I spoke with my sister, because she and I do have great conversations about politics, she's she has kind of she's she's more what I'd call a reluctant royal monarchist. So it's the way I see it is, I am a Republican by principle. In my ideal world, we would have a democratic elected head of state. Because I see that's because I think in in twenty first century. Yeah, but what you could end up with Boris Johnson. Yeah, that yeah, that's true. Then the, 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 we also end up with King Andrew, as you said. <laughs> yes, on the other okay. hand, but I, I, I suppose mean, it might be easier to depose a monarch than it would be an elected head of state, and and quite a few people. I hadn't thought of this before. Be very, very careful what you wish for, James. The country is in a dangerous state of flux, and today's monarchy is a force for moderation. Certainly a force for stability. I hadn't thought of that before. But if you look at what populations can be persuaded to vote for, particularly with Vladimir Putin's fingers all over the pie, maybe having the system that we've currently got is, for the time being, the best available option. Well, the thing is, that's actually that leads to my main point, you see. Yes. Because one, one of the points that she always said, my sister said to me is, is, is to what end? Um, because she always, always said this, I mean... Here's the, here's the thing as I see it now. Yes. The, the monarchy does, to an extent, remove a lot of the pomp and ceremony from our elected leaders. Oh. We, and it does humble them, in a sense, because it does make our elected leaders more, remind them, they are elected civil, um, they are a public So the servant. fact that they have to bow and curtsy to the monarch keeps their feet on the ground. In a sense, because when you think about it, James... That's in really America, interesting. So the one in, with no America, power, you have to show deference to the one with no power as a way of keeping the one with power grounded. In a way, cause, because cause remember, we, we do chose, choose our elected leaders. Because in, in America, well, James, trust. The, closest, the closest things... That's yeah, true. The closest things we they have in America to the monarchy are, is the presidency. Because when you think about it, they, their, their, their aristocracy are the Clintons, are the... Are the Obamas? Are the Kennedys? And and then when you look at and when you look at how the president of France is treated with such grandeur, it, what is what is the president of France but the elected Dauphin? So the so the royal family become a receptacle for these slightly weird human enthusiasms and impulses we have with regard to deference and pageantry, but they don't get the trappings of power that would render the deference and pageantry dangerous. In, in a way, yes. Well, and I thought I you the, were a lazy Republican. Do you mean you're a lazy monarchist now? I think I'm, I think I'm towing the line between the two. I got to say, my sister very nearly turned me. It's but a good place to be. Has anyone ever told you that you sound very similar to Richard Aoardi? Oh, thank you. That's a that's a that's a, that's a real big compliment. Thank I hope you. So. It's intended to be a compliment. I think he's absolutely a wonderful character, a I brilliant like force for good. But has, no one's ever picked up on that before. No, it's the first time. I'd say I will remember that, James. Well, but I will, especially uh, when you said my name. Then the way you said James had a real ring of Richard Aoardi to it. Oh, well, God bless you. <laughs> I don't know why that popped into my head. And I'm delighted that you're as flattered by it as I intended you to be. As one of my all-time favourite. Uh, thank you, Reese. So, so I like that, the idea of it being ambivalent. So ambivalent. No one's arguing with ambivalence. No one's really arguing with ambivalence. Uh, in fact, Reese is even more ambivalent than an ambivalent person. Does ambivalence prolong the existence of the royal family or curtail it? Because the more you thought about it, the harder it would be to justify. So you don't think about it, which is good news for the royal family. Or does the fact that we don't really feel passionately about it anymore, and that's where I think my comparison between 1981 wedding and 2011 wedding becomes pertinent, the fact that we don't really feel it anymore, we're not really feeling it, as the young people say, means that survival becomes less likely. So is widespread ambivalence 
good news or bad news for the royal family? 03456060973. I like that. Quite a few comments about what you might get instead. It's a timely moment. I'll talk to Tara next. A timely moment to have a little look at what is going on in America. We'll, we'll begin with Donald Trump um, sending a personal message to Jill Biden, which I think you need to hear to believe. Jill, get your fat husband off the couch. Get that, get that fat pig off the couch. Tell him to go and vote for Trump. He's going to save our country. Get that guy the hell off her. Get him up, Jill. Slap him around. Get him up. Get him up, Jill. We want him off the couch. Okay, so that's Donald Trump campaigning to be president of the United States of America. And so far, his obvious cognitive decline, drawing a heck of a lot less attention than, of course, Joe Biden's did before his decision to step down in favor of Kamala Harris. But if you are worried about Donald Trump's cognitive decline, then do not worry anymore because everything is absolutely fine. It's, uh, and I actually call for a cognitive test for all people wanting to run for president. I think not based on age, you know, some of the greatest leaders in the world, and I'm not 80 and I'm not that close to 80, but uh, in the Biden case, he's 81 or 82. And you know, that's okay because I know people that are unbelievably successful. By the way, a man who's very successful is Rupert Murdoch and he's 93 or 94. He was at a meeting that I had the following day and he's sharp as you can be. I mean, he's the same guy that I've known for 25, 30 years. He's sharp and he's in his 90s. Um, we've had some of the greatest leaders in world history that are in their 80s. And, uh, but it was very interesting because in reading the article, they were, it was a great article, but I appreciated that they said that. It's very nice that they say it. I've done cognitive tests. I've done them twice and I aced both of them. And the doctor in one case said, I've never seen anybody ace them. They've never seen anybody ace him, but I'd like to see cognitive tests for anybody running for president or vice president. You can start by asking how close to 80 is 78, which is his age, I think. And he said, I'm, no, I'm not near 80. So, I mean, I, under what? I suppose 79 is nearer. He's not 79 until June, I think, of next year. But goodness me, what, a, what an almighty mess everything is. And just to put a smile on your face, would you like to hear the American equivalent of me? doing a Vox Pop outside a Donald Trump rally. Um, I, I, people think it, it's really... I don't understand why more people don't do it. Because the question is always really obvious in that moment. And here it is, American style. What got you excited to come to the Trump rally today? It's a good man. I love him. We need him. It saved the country. You love him? Yeah. I think he's a good man. What do you think? Uh, why, uh, when did you decide he was, he was such a good man? Uh, 2016. I liked his, I liked his words, and I like he did everything he said he was going to do, and he did it. So what are some of those things that that he said, and then he did? Uh, he did just one thing. One thing he said, and then he did. He caught me off guard there. I just, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so why is it? Why do you say just one thing? How many times have you heard me say that? Go on, just give me one thing. Just just one thing. I did it on Friday, I think. Someone rang in to say the program was full of untruths or that lots of things have been said on the program that weren't true. I said, just give me one. Just one thing. And they said, well, I haven't been listening. <laughs> Which is possibly even more embarrassing than saying, well, I think you caught me off guard there. Why is that? Isn't that fascinating? Both sides of the Atlantic, strong opinions, strong enough to go to a rally. What is it you like about this guy? He does those things. What things? You know those things. Name one thing. It's like Brexit all over again. 12.47 is the time. There's an even worse clip of Donald Trump, which I think I might treat you to tomorrow. Uh, if you haven't seen it already, I'll give you a clue. It involves golf. And speaking of clues, I've completely forgotten to do today's missing word headline thing from it's not cauliflower this no one would get this right there's no earthly way i could sit here for a million years you know what they say about if you give 
an army of monkeys, a hundred typewriters, eventually they'd write the complete works of Shakespeare. I understand the logic behind that claim. I think I could sit here for a million years and no one would ever get this right. Because, well, I'm not telling you why. So here it is. Can you fill in the gap on this one? Ready? Water firms to replace lead pipes by blank. Water firms to replace lead pipes by blank. Now, I don't like accusing you of fibbing, but if anyone sends in the correct answer to 84850 or WhatsApps it to 03456060973, I will be 99.99999% recurring, certain that you are lying. Because that, for me, is the hardest missing word round that we have ever done on the program. Water firms to replace lead pipes by blank. It's 12.49. Tara's in Guildford to steer us back to the royal family ambivalence and lazy republicanism. What would you like to say, Tara? Hi, James. Hello. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm You're a bit nervous. Welcome. I'm it's 18, a, it, so it's, it's a bit Well, it, it, you know, the, the, the naivety of youth. You shouldn't be nervous at all. What would you like to say? <laughs> um, I actually disagree with um, there being ambivalence because I think there's quite a censorship um, on mainstream media about talking about the monarchy and the actual role of the monarchy and whether it should still exist. So I think opposition to the monarchy is in many times sort of suppressed as it's quite a taboo topic. So I actually believe that the monarchy will survive because as it's, long as... What do you mean when you say censorship? You make, you make the hairs on the back of my neck stand up slightly because <laughs> um, you, you, you can now tell me whatever you want. And this yeah. is, although some people may not like it, this is mainstream media. You're on it now. Yeah. Saying whatever you want about the thing that you think is yeah. censored. Um, I mean, sort of um, newspapers such as, from either side of the political spectrum, so okay. The Guardian or The Daily Mail, obviously. But I, I don't think, think it's, it's censored. I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to focus in on the point unduly, but The Daily Mail peddles a very pro-monarchist line. It's not censored in the sense that somebody somewhere is telling them not to. They choose to and they want to. And The Guardian peddles a mildly Republican line and, and that, that, that yeah. is because they want to. So I think people are allowed to say whatever they want, but I think perhaps not enough oxygen is given to the powerful mm. arguments against the royal family and that yeah. might be down to a subconscious self-censorship um yeah i think i think maybe censorship is too strong of a word it just gets um, my it gets my heckles up yeah. i probably shouldn't have jumped um, down your throat like that. i'm sorry <laughs> no, but I, I do believe that it, there's definitely um suppression of an open conversation maybe. i know that in context within um friends even amongst young people it's just very um frowned upon and how much do you talk about openly. it how often does it come um, up not that frequently, but no. when it does, it's sort of, it's quite, um, it's, it's frowned upon to oppose the monarchy. Really? And have so if you, if, you, if you laid out all the reasons why it's ridiculous to have a monarchy in the 21st century, your friends would think that you were a bit out of order? Um, potentially. Gosh. Or it's, it's sort of, it's one of those topics of conversation which um, are avoided sort of out of fear that there will be opposition to the monarchy i find well, so that's, that, why that, I believe, that's really interesting that's why i believe there's to a degree some sort of censorship or a, a subconscious censorship it goes i think as well with those people don't, we don't look away you can't be what you can't see so if you don't actually talk about dismantling yeah. the monarchy then the likelihood of it happening decreases accordingly yeah. and the more you and think about it the more yeah. likely we are to wake up one day and say up with this we will not put yeah i think that um it sort of um the people in power so in government i know obviously the people in government cannot oppose the monarchy however that yeah. in itself is a form of suppressed um, suppressed not censored yeah. The conversation is a bit suppressed. So, so the big yeah. powers that be in the media, they don't really want to have a conversation about abolishing the monarchy because, I don't know, they're hoping to I, 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 
get some sort of knighthood or something further down the line or there's I mean I so I might want a knighthood in which case I can't talk about the abolition I think you might be onto something there and so the conversation the opinion formers in society are reluctant to have the conversation for, for what might be quite personal reasons there's some extraordinary answers to the question of uh, what's missing from this headline water firms to replace lead pipes by blank my favorite so far is by James <laughs> no it's not I'm not going to do it I, I'm definitely not going to do it um well, well I've got too many no, tomorrow says Bob in Romford um nobody and, and someone uh, Mark yeah at least you're honest to say that you've looked it up or you've seen that you've seen the headline already because there's no way anyone's going to guess this correctly osmosis is a good one that was quite funny there's, there's, well done there's a lot going on here uh, plastic uh, the missing word is obvious yes again caroline says osmosis it's all good um uh, the answer is 3273 ad and it's not a typo as far as i can tell water firms to replace lead pipes by 3273 ad john is in edinburgh john by two, 3273 ad do you think we'll still have a royal family of course you will not a problem at all 20 20 it's a thousand we might not even have a species left but the royal family will still be clinging yeah. on there what made you pick up the phone today I think ambivalence is what you talked about. Yes. And I think that, yeah, the, the country is entirely ambivalent um, uh, about the uh, aristocracy and royal family. Yes. Uh, and I think that you are trained not to think about things. You just don't talk about things like you didn't talk about the empire. For this a long, is a bit long. like what Tara was saying. I, I bridled when she said yeah. censorship, which was a bit silly of me. But you're right. You're, we're trained not to yeah. talk about it. Almost. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, here, here's a couple of examples, and I'm going to shock you with some figures here, okay? Um, yes. N n the royal family or any of the aristocracy do not pay death duties. They, they arrange their tax affairs into trust, and they never actually own it personally, but the trust continues. So they, the they would, I recently, think, they'd be eligible for probably capital gains tax if they ever sold. Talk about death duties Talk about death duties I know, here. I know, so I know. The Duke of Westminster recently inherited £9.6 billion pounds yes. and did not pay any death duties on it. Inheritance tax. Inheritance tax. Yes. Okay, so there's one rule for the royal family and the aristocracy and one rule for the rest of us. No, because he took advantage of trust law. Mm -hmm. the, Who writes trust law? The, the, do you, do you, no, he could. I mean, and anyone could take advantage of trust law in the way that he did, but absolutely. only if they are in possession of the country's largest fortunes. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not disputing afford, your point. And also if you can afford to do it. Yes, that's very true. You've got to be able to afford it. This is a very, very expensive process to do. Okay? And, 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 and they... Are, they have, I they, do they actually make, understand this. I'm not going to tell you why I understand this. No, except, okay. Except okay. It, uh, to go so far as to say it has absolutely no relevance to my personal situation. But what... <laughs> but, <laughs> but not by a long chalk, John. Not by a long chalk. But, but a trust is not part of your estate. So Correct. It, it, you don't own it. You I know. Own so, yeah, it, precisely. So you're handing it down from generation to generation, and each Correct. custodian of the estate is not actually allowed to... Correct. Yeah. So, it, it, I mean, it, it sounds wrong, because it is wrong, but it's it also not wrong, because it is the law, if you see what no I mean. Other, I can think of no other country in the world that does such a thing. Well, I, no, nor okay. can I. Here's, here's, here's another one to shock you. Go on, that didn't shock me. I knew that one already. Try again. Okay, right. Okay, okay. People talk about, um, you know, slavery and retribution, etc., you know, re reparation and so on and so forth. They do. Okay? Yes. Right. Now, I'm not suggesting for one moment that one can enter into the, the conversation of reparation, but I think you've got to actually come back from the conversation a little bit and say, how much money was paid to the slave owners in UK... I saw, you, I, saw ja I saw Jacob Rees-Mogg complaining the other day and saying that we should, they should pay us reparations for all the good that slavery did around the world. And I thought, well, mate, yeah. if Eton gave refunds, your parents would be at the front of the queue because the reparations <laughs> that were paid to slave owners were absolutely enormous. Do you know how much they were, by the way? Off Just the top so of my head, no. Go on, fill yeah. your boots. Think of, think of a figure. Go on, think of one. Uh, for, for £40 billion. Pounds. Go way up. Four hundred billion pounds. 
Not quite, but you're talking about 250 billion. Wow. And the same people that were paid that money were the ones that that profited from it for years. Are still the people that own all the land. Not all of them, but enough. And you know, of course, to 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 come full circle. And they're the ones that don't pay debt duties. It's a brilliant analysis. Uh, And to come full circle, uh, the last Duke of Westminster said my all time favourite thing about being wealthy in this country in the 21st century. Do you know what it was? No, I don't. Ha, you see. Don't know it all, do you, John? You haven't got oh, it all. No. You haven't got it all. He said, he was, someone asked <laughs> him for works. advice on being minted. They may not have put it quite like that. And he said, my advice to you, old boy. I don't know if he said old boy, but I like to think so. Old Pip, yeah. old fruit. My advice to you, old Pip, is to have an ancestor who was best friends with William the Conqueror. <laughs> And there it is. Yeah. And we're still here talking about whether it's good for the rest of the country or not. I, I think I said the missing word, Keith. 3,273 AD. But I'll read this as a last word from the No Hostages Twitter account. You can't inherit titles, credits, affection, privileges and assets by right of blood and then claim that it's unreasonable for people to hold you responsible for the acts of your ancestors. And there's one of the reasons why ambivalence is perhaps the royal family's friend in this context. That's it from me for another day. We'll be doing it all again tomorrow from 10, although possibly in a slightly different order. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, where you can also pause and rewind live radio as well as listen to a range of podcasts. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. 